So hello everyone, I'm Jackie Orway uh, and as Chair of ICMP Global Board on behalf of John Phelan, Director General of ICMP, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this year's Central and Eastern European Music Publishers Conference. A special thanks to the Hungarian MPA for hosting this year's event. Uh, we're joined by the co-presidents of the HMPA, Dr. Tunde Moses-Sither and Gustav Stiedl, who will be speaking shortly. And even though the beauty of Budapest and its sublime music are denied to us in person this year, it's still wonderful to come together virtually to discuss issues of particular relevance to the region. We're looking forward to convening in real life at next year's event. I want to extend a particular welcome to our special guest, Dr. Peter Lobody, Head of Copyright Department at the Hungarian IPO, and we'll hear from Peter shortly. Uh, but first, very quickly, I'm pleased to have the chance to tell you about some recent structural developments in our global, global trade body designed to enable even closer engagement with our members on our policy work for Europe. We've set up regional policy discussion groups for Europe and also LATAM and Africa, and there are more to come. We now have a specialist legal committee and a new technical working group populated with experts from our membership community to tackle detailed issues of importance to our industry with forensic focus. Our metrics working group is driving a project to collate publishing industry data crucial in supporting our lobbying efforts globally. Our MPA members will receive requests for relevant data and we need your help in responding to ensure the success of this effort, please. Our policy work ranges globally and for Europe, current highlights include close engagement on the Digital Services Act, work in the Czech Republic, intervening with Parliament to defeat the risk of licensing exemptions. We're heavily engaged on lobbying in relation to geo-blocking regulation, where the Commission was obliged to look specifically at the digital music market. And the favourable outcome we obtained was particularly important for countries such as Hungary, with a relatively lower Spotify subscription price, avoiding an upward harmonisation of pricing for music services, carrying with it the attendant risk of increased piracy. And of course, we're working hard on the copyright directive implementation across Europe in its various forms, not least in Hungary, which was one of the first countries to fully implement the directive, but more on that shortly. Be assured that wherever a copyright issue is impacting our industry and the creators we represent, the ICMP will be active. To support this effort, we have some new faces amongst us. Rafael Kowanaki has joined us as senior legal officer, Jenny McLeod Agri, has joined as EA and operations expert, and Tarek Koturak has joined as our intern with his significant legal input. And now we come neatly to our agenda, which today will feature a video of contributions from a number of our NPA regional members, panels providing insights into industry issues in Russia and Hungary, and a specialist panel on collective rights management in Europe. We have some expert speakers and highly experienced moderators and we're very grateful to all our contributors today. But first, our hosts, the co-presidents of the Hungarian MPA, will share with us some opening remarks. So it's my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Tundi moses GM of UMP Hungary, and Gustav Stiedl of Schubert Music Publishing. Thank you, and over to you, Tunde and Gustav. Thank you, Jackie. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. I am very pleased to be, uh, to, to, to be able to welcome you all. Uh, although this year we only have the opportunity to meet online, I am happy to be one of the hosts as the chair of classical department of the Hungarian Music Publishers Association. Our organization has 13 members, including market leading publishers, as well as small businesses in Hungary. Although our market activity and business focuses are different, they all share the same goal, beside the business goals, to create a connection between composition and performer, and to protect the rights of authors and works based on common interests. Before we get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you at ICMP management, 
who generously helped us make this event come together to become a success. Thank you, Jackie, John, Özlem, and the new colleagues, Jenny and Tariq. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. I think we can all say that since our last personal meeting in Ljubljana, our lives, business environment, and working methods have changed, not significantly, but slightly. The pandemic also posed challenges for the music publishing profession, and everyone had to find solutions in their own circumstances. However, uh, communication and exchange of information is always a help for all of us. And over the last one and a half year, ICMP has given every opportunity to do so. We have now come together to share information about our current business environment, experiences about collective right management, and the changes that the adoption of new European Union copyright law has brought in our countries. I hope this meeting helps all of us grow to be more productive and smart. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time as I need to leave some time uh, for uh, Gustav Stiedl, chair of the light music department of our Hungarian association. A very warm welcome to everyone and thank you very much for listening. Uh, let us welcome Gustav. Thank you. Thank you, Tinda. And thank you, thank you, Jackie. It's not easy to, to say anything more after you, you two, because you, you almost touched all the, all the important things that we are in uh, today and nowadays. Um, for last year, together with ICMP, we wanted to, to make a great anniversary uh, conference here in Budapest, and we, we almost uh, arranged everything to, to have it just uh, finally. This situation with, with COVID and this pan pandemic uh, just um, crossed our, our, our plans, unfortunately. Uh, some years ago, we could not believe that this kind of conference can be held without personal meetings, as it is very, very important, and I believe it will be important in the future as well. But with the, the help of ICMP, uh, we can have all the, the necessary information together and with a lot of very interesting and, and very useful topics today, we will be able to discuss and, and learn from, from other territories uh, as we wanted to have it when this whole conference started around 20 years ago uh, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, welcome everybody and we are very uh, pleased to to have you and hopefully in the near future we will we will meet personally once again in, in Budapest as you can see behind me you could have this beautiful view if you could be here with us uh, but really would like to see you soon as soon as possible um, this is my pleasure to to ask Mr Labody to have some words uh, to you and introduce how it is in in Hungary nowadays. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you, Katinda, for such a, it does help to set things in context, context. And we're really grateful to you for your backdrop, Gustav, because it gives us some, some sense of location. Um, so now we're very fortunate indeed to have the opportunity to hear from the, Dr. Peter Lavady, uh, head of copyright department, the Hungarian IPO, um, a lawyer by training. Uh, Peter is responsible for advising both the Hungarian government authorities and Hungary's EU-based permanent representation, as well as local market actors on the implications of law from a copyright expert perspective. Um, Peter will share some remarks. Uh, then if we have time, he's kindly agreed to, to have a short conversation with me afterwards. So thank you so much for joining us, Peter, and uh, over to you. Yes, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for this for this invitation, of course, and your kind words for uh, before uh, I take the floor. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, I, I think it's a must from Hungary to to welcome all the guests uh, in, in such occasions uh, to say that uh, it's a pity that you could not join us here in person. Uh, I can see from the window that the, the leaves are already yellow. It's a beautiful autumn here, so maybe next time uh, uh, it would be great that, that if you could make it. 
Uh, I work, uh, as it has been said, uh, for the uh, head of the of, of the Hungarian Intellectual Property Office, the head of the Copyright Department, and uh, one might think that. Uh, uh, IP offices in the region uh, uh, focus on industrial property issues, but it's not the case uh, in Hungary because uh, our office has uh, quite important uh, copyright uh, related activities as well. This means that um, we take part in discussions uh, both internationally within the premises of, of the World Intellectual Property Organization, but as well in Brussels and EU lawmaking processes. Uh, we discuss, negotiate uh, with the stakeholders there. We also have as an important task here is the uh, uh, supervision of collective management organizations. We also register them uh, and try to make sure uh, that they uh, function in line with uh, the rules that are set for, for CMOs. We also provide licenses for orphan works, etc. Uh, the thing here is that I would like to mention that we have uh, strong copyright activities. So with this, I'm extremely happy that I can participate here. And um, having observed the agenda and also the introductory remarks, I wish to focus on two main uh, elements that I think worth mentioning here on this event. One is the implementation of the copyright in, in the digital single market directive in Hungary, and especially uh, it's article 17, which I think all those know who are not familiar with copyright. Uh, um, and the other thing, uh, is the implementation of uh, the Collective Rights Management Directive. And even though it has, it was done a few years ago, it still has some impacts uh, also if we consider that the uh, Digital Single Market Directive, its Article 12 has very relevant uh, collective licensing uh, um, provisions. So to turn on the uh, collective, uh, 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 on, the, on the Copyright Directive, uh, the CDSN Directive, I think I will, uh, talk a few about the approach we took in Hungary uh, within the implementation, uh, then the process uh, we went through, uh, some problems we had to face with. I'm sure it's not Hungarian problems, these, but uh, of course European problems, and, and maybe a few words about the outcome. So first, the approach we took, uh, as you are all familiar with, it's a huge directive uh, with very many provisions and a whole modernization of uh, European copyright rules. So we thought that it is very important that we start a very open and inclusive process within the implementation. This means that uh, we try to call as many stakeholders uh, into this work uh, to get to know their comments, not only from Hungary, but from, from abroad as well. We wanted to have as an approach, a balanced approach which means that, of course, this directive has a very relevant and very important European level, a European context, a European market is tackled by this directive, a European digital single market. So this has to be kept in mind, uh, which means that in our view, uh, the implementations should avoid uh, making very specific regulations, which do not keep in mind this European context. But on the other hand, it's, it was very important for us to maintain those rules and those models which we have in our uh, existing uh, Hungarian framework and do not want to reinvent the wheel in situations which are already functioning well and of course which are not in contradiction with the directive. And thirdly, our approach was also to avoid over-regulation and leave room for the market here because it's very important that uh, at the end of the day business uh, partners we have to work on this field uh, which we uh, tackle with. And now on the process. Uh, well, to say, to be honest, it was quite a long and winding road. Uh, we spent two years with this process uh, and uh, we thought that it is very important to start as soon as possible after the adoption of the directive. So already in 2019, the end, the last month of 2019, we introduced workshops, six workshops with, uh, with Hungarian stakeholders, but we also invited uh, colleagues from the region, from the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania, uh, Poland, to have to get to know their thoughts and to try to, 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 to get on the same track within this region. 
In 2020 spring, uh, we already implemented the part which is related to the distance learning uh, exception in the directive. This is very important because uh, as you might know, maybe in your family life as well, that many teachers struggled with teaching online students. Of course, this had implications in copyright law as well. So we thought it was very important to already provide the possibilities to teachers here. Um, the whole process was like a ping pong game. Uh, we, we put together drafts, we send them to the stakeholders, we receive their comments and we send them back. It, there were five rounds here. So it was really um, a very, very strong uh, uh, work. Uh, but I think this way we could keep uh, uh, on track and we could receive all the important uh, 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 comments uh, coming from the stakeholders. And what has already been said in the introductory remarks, we were quite fortunate to, to uh, implement this directive on time. We were the second ones in the European Union to manage to do this. So in, from the 1st of June, it's uh, in effect and, uh, and, uh, and we are very happy because of this. As you might know, uh, the European Commission has already announced that uh, they have initiated infringement procedures against almost 20 member states who are still struggling with this implementation. And now a few words on the problems which you had to face with Article 17. I'm sure these will not be surprises for you. Of course, the whole this whole article was like a, in, in a constant swinging uh, from the European proposal, from the Commission's proposal, it was quite a basic thing, uh, not tackling copyright liability of platforms, just, just having very simple rules. And then the adopted directive went across this red line of liability and introduced this liability. And then I think right orders could be happy with this result, but then came the commission uh, very late with the guidances, which somehow uh, changed this, uh, uh, this framework uh, and tried to balance it towards the users as well. So following this kind of swinging was a very problematic thing for those member states who wanted to keep the deadline of implementation. Uh, what we also had to face with is the, the new liability regime introduced a somewhat Anglo-Saxon uh, um, liability regime, this best efforts regime, which was totally alien to our Hungarian system. We had to somehow put it into our system. And it's not a secret that uh, the platforms are very keen on following this, uh, coming from a perspective that they want to have a liability, which is a, a level playing field in all the member states. And finally, uh, uh, a great problem or a great question was asked the, for us was the, were these exceptions here. We had no parody exception, no pastiche exception, and no criticism or review exception, even though we, we of course, had quotation. That was something to be uh, introduced. And finally, the outcome where we, where we got uh, in June. I think what can be said in an overall manner is that uh, we, we go to a text which is quite balanced. It's, it's close to the directive. Uh, it has a general scope, but we avoided to putting together or putting into this system specific Hungarian um, 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 solutions. So unlike uh, in the case of Germany or other countries or Finland, where there are specific regimes, uh, we avoided this because we thought, as I mentioned already, the approach that this is a European directive, this should be European provisions. This also means that uh, uh, this, is, this system is open to market deals, uh, open to uh, following maybe later on regulatory best practices that can be seen from uh, the developing EU framework. But on the other side, very important that in our belief, it also provides a safety net for right holders. After the adoption of the directive, it cannot be questioned whether the functioning of these platforms shall qualify as a copyright relevant act, which needs um, uh, the license from the right holders. And now, having uh, talked so much about uh, the CDSM directive, maybe a few words on the, on the collective management regime and uh, how it changed or where we focus after the uh, European directive uh, was adopted here. At the time of the adoption of this directive in 2016, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Hungary already had a quite long tradition and a well-established system of collective management. Uh, this also meant that uh, uh, in, the, in the 
upcoming panel, you will see, uh, you will hear uh, Mr. Andar Singer coming for Artisus. Artisus clearly is a significant player in the region. So uh, uh, this means that we had a well-functioning system uh, of collective management here. We had uh, an authorization regime, which means that uh, those who wanted to start uh, functioning as a collective management organization, provide services as CMOs needed authorization from the authority. We did not have any legal monopolies, but there was there were de facto monopolies on the market. And what is also important and uh, about which you I'm sure aware, but uh, it's not common knowledge within Europe, we had a broad ECL regime, uh, which also now a part of European legislation coming from Article 12 of the directive. Uh, by the way, we're quite strong supporters of this of this provision. Uh, by uh, it, it was important for us to provide legal safety here that the European law uh, uh, accepts these kind of systems. And lastly, uh, our system had a quite strong supervision uh, from the authority, which was important from uh, the, the, the safeguards, how these collective management organizations operate. So within the system, when implementing the collective rights management directive, we wanted to keep these main pillars as much as possible, because as I said, in our view, we thought that this is a well-functioning marketplace. Of course, there were need to be done some kind of uh, fine tuning uh, activities, but overall, we thought that the main pillars were important. And now, within the functioning, I would like to focus on three main uh, focuses or, or three main relevant points, main aspects which we consider important in collective management uh, uh, in Hungary. One is that it is the CMO which works for the right orders and not the other way around. So, this means that uh, right holders rights should be protected uh, and this can be ensured by uh, safeguarding uh, the that the bylaws uh, of the cmos are in line with the with the with the rules with the, with which are out uh, which are outlined in the law it's also very important that there are strong transparency and accountancy rules because this these of course uh, uh, provide a good basis for, for confidence against collective management. Of course, it's also important for the right holders. And in order to guarantee these safeguards of transparency, accountancy, and, um, and, uh, and the right holders' rights, a strong supervision is also needed uh, in our view. And this is performed by uh, the Hungarian IP office. Without dwelling into much um, details here, we have the ex ante tools, which means we, also, we still have a registration process, a notification process uh, from stakeholders. And we also have ex post tools, which means a very important complaint procedure running in Hungary. And this is a possibility not only for right holders to complain if they think that their rights have been breached by the CMOs, but also for users if they think that the collective management organizations do not function uh, in line with the law. We also have uh, annual ad hoc supervisory procedures, which focus on the bylaws, basically. And if there is some kind of uh, breach of these obligations by the CMOs, we also have sanctions that can be applied, which include fines, the revoking of the license, a ban from collective management activities, and etc. We think that this role of the state having these kind of, of powers is very important for the overall confidence in the functioning of the system. And on how these in practice apply and work, uh, I think the participants of the last panel who will deal with the, the Hungarian system will tell you more. And lastly, uh, please allow me a personal remark. Um, I am just about to start a new position within the office, which will mean that I will be in charge of other related activities in the field of IP, so not only copyright, but industrial property rights as well. Such a change uh, always brings some fear about how one will be able to tackle with these new challenges with a background which is strongly focused on copyright. And when complaining, uh, I was told by IP lawyers that uh, if I had the chance to work in the copyright field, which is extremely complex, not only due to its special regulatory framework, but because of the intertwining interest in this sector, then this will be a strong basis for me to cope with these challenges. So this is my final message that in Hungary, I believe that the IP office is uh, somewhat aware of the delicate and complex nature of this sector. Uh, 
And we intend to tackle copyright matters with this in mind, also when we convey our messages to political decision makers. So please rely on us if you have any doubts, criticisms, questions, observations about the Hungarian system or its functioning. We stand ready to cooperate with you on them. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. That was incredibly sort of coherent and um, uh, pithy explanation of, of your implementation process. And we congratulate you on the, uh, on the speed of your, of your implementation of the Copyright Directive in Hungary. Um, and also you were casting some pearls uh, before us as well in terms of acknowledgement of uh, CMOs being there for, for the benefit of the repertoire and the right holders. That is obviously music to, to your audience's ears. So, so thank you for that. And also for your very pragmatic approach to, to implementation as European law without trying to uh, sort of be so specific that it fails in terms of future proofing. That, that was all incredibly helpful. So. Um, to, to start with the, the copyright directive, obviously um, any piece of legislation for a community is going to be a, a basket of, of pros and cons and a sort of balancing act that comes from it. Obviously for the publishers, uh, there have been concerns around the, as you, as you mentioned, the, uh, the introduction of, of exemptions and, and how the, how the parody uh, exception in particular might be interpreted. Um, do you have any sort of words of comfort for us in terms of um, the impact you think those exceptions might have uh, on right holders and how how we might gain some certainty in terms of interpretation of those provisions. Thank you. Well, um, it's 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 not an easy question, but of course I will try to to to, to calm you <laughs> in this respect. Uh, uh, well, in Hungary. Um, what we saw in practice is that uh, uh, even though we did not have these exceptions, there were these exceptions, for example, the per parody were functioning in practice. So already we could see on YouTube many GIFs, uh, many memes, all these kind of things. So I think uh, now that there's a legal background here might not change that much in the framework. What we had to consider here is that we do we intend to introduce such an approach that, the, for example, the German lawmaker did to introduce new exceptions here? I mean, exceptions which go beyond what is coming from the from the directive, uh, or to or to introduce such a system of earmarking or labeling contents or the, or that kind of special regime which comes from the guidance of the Commission? We thought that uh, we will refrain from activities here. Uh, of course, if it, it was coming from a practical perspective as well, if you we wanted to keep the deadline of implementations, it just could not have happened because the guidance was, was published on Friday and the deadline of the implementations was on next Monday. So, so, I mean, it was something that we had to omit. So our approach was that we want to keep it on a general level. And then if we see how the market uh, uh, will develop, how best practices will, will develop in certain member states, then maybe we will be ready to change our system and get to more specific rules. But, I, but it's up to the market uh, uh, to handle the situation. Of course, it is very important to provide a legal framework, a safety net, as I said, to the right holders where they can step up against platforms uh, in such discussions and, and omitting those kind of legal debates which, which, which are settled already and, and try to focus on, on business aspects here. Thank you, that, that's, that's very helpful. Um, and uh, Article 17, obviously, the, the big the big win, 17-1, the as you say, the uh, the clear the clear statement of liability for, for platforms. Um, in in your transposition of it, how does that relate to 17-4? It's quite a technical question, but it's but it's hugely important to publishers to understand um, whether whether the uh, the way you have transposed Article 17-4 um, is that a mitigation against the liability or is it a statement of of the liability not applying if those if those mm -hmm. if those workarounds are are adopted by a platform. Well, it, it was a huge debate uh, uh, even during the discussions how how this these parts should be interpreted, which is a bit. Uh, 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 so to say, confusing for all of us that we try to interpret uh, this directive, and and when it, it depends on where you are coming, how you interpret it, it's 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 not a very easy easy part. So yes, actually, what we how we tried to uh, um, tackle this Article 17 thing was that um, 
we wanted to fit it into our already existing system of, of uh, communication to the public. Uh, we, we already were in a position that uh, that the that how these platforms operate should qualify as a, as a co uh, communication to the public, which in certain terms is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, licensed by collective management organizations and in certain terms by the rights users themselves. So this was not a big issue, even though uh, uh, on the European level, there were debates also here, whether it's a clarification or a new right that is coming from here. Well, so we settled that this way. We also saw that, uh, that uh, the liability can only be mitigated therefore so it's not something that can be fully avoided here so uh, we are coming from a part where where there's a user where there's a right holders there's a license situation uh, and and the exceptions could kick in but if we are talking about this new liability regime this can also only relate to mitigation and here kicks in the very important uh, aspect of proportionality uh, what we can expect from what services this could mean a very high level from huge platforms and can mean a lower level in this mitigation from small services so that is something where there can be a, a way of maneuver uh, but it's not an absolute uh, exclusion of liability in any of the cases. Fantastic. I think I'm moving to Hungary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so um, moving now to the to the the uh, CRM directive um, and you and you very helpfully mentioned the uh, uh, the operation of the extended collective licensing regime regime for the performing right in Hungary, which um, obviously is is uh, is notable um, and I wonder if I could ask you about how that, um, whether you see tension between that regime and the principle of right holders choice, which obviously is very important to publishers, and perhaps the, the where those two concepts meet is around the facility for opting out of any extended collective licensing scheme. Um, I mean, is your view that it's the opt out which, which mitigates concerns around right holder choice for, for the operation of ECL? And if so, do you think the, the opt-out should be should be very easily um, facilitated, facilitated, and sort of practical for publishers to to operate? Yes, uh, thanks for this question. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very uh, important aspect of our of our collective management system, this ECL, and I'm very happy that, of course, you are aware of this because it's always an issue, not only uh, uh, making others know about that we have this ECL system, but but also in trying to explain what ECL means. So, so it's it's also an aspect. Uh, yes, uh, I think what you're uh, uh, what you're referring to is a very, as I said, very important thing in uh, in. Uh, in this context, I think Article 12 of the CMO of the collective uh, management, not the collective management directive, but the CDSM directive also provided some uh, some further uh, provisions. So from our general system of maybe not allowing opt out uh, in a very flexible way, uh, being maybe more rigid uh, in the context, uh, if we compare it to the CDSM directive, we introduced changes here. So we thought that there is something that needs to be modified uh, in order to, to, to comply with these new rules. So without going into much details, certainly this is a part that had to be revisited uh, by us. And we, we thought that there is something to be done and it has been done during the implementation process. So by consulting right orders, CMOs on, 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 on this issue, we move towards a more flexible way, uh, a more flexible part. I think uh, it's, it's a very delicate thing. And already also to mention that our system, I think was something which was wor working quite well functioning quite well also in terms of 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 uh, of, of data and in terms of um of, of the numbers the cmos could provide here in this region so we didn't want to abolish this system uh wanted to fine-tune it and this was certainly a part where, where where we where we did something sure i think i think it's um it's a dilemma isn't it the uh the market is is in transition right now. Obviously, we have companies offering live, um, sort of direct licensing services for live performance very successfully in different countries. Um, we have a very competitive market now, actually, in, in terms of CMO service provision. So, so it's and and publishers are always focused on what's best for songwriters, how best to deliver the most um, sort of cost efficient solutions. So, so it's helpful to hear that that. Uh, um, that you have introduced flexibility. I suppose 
the, the, the simple question is whether it's possible to opt out of ECL at a repertoire level. I think at that point it becomes, it becomes actually workable for publishers as opposed to having to go song by song, proving chain of title by work. I suppose that's a very specific question, but are you, are you, is, is that now a possibility in, in Hungary? We, we, uh, I think there's another aspect which is also very important is the timing, uh, whether it can be, there was also an issue that, uh, that this could only happen once, once a year, but only by the effect of the next year. This is the, this is the part where we wanted to tackle this situation uh, first. So, uh, of course, we will observe the market uh, uh, on how this will evolve, but, uh, but here, here we thought that there, there is need to be done something very, very quickly. Uh, of course, there are, we introduced other uh, very flexible opt-out uh, uh, terms in in the special the special regimes that were introduced by the CDS and directive for example in the out of commerce work uh, uh, there is also a very uh, um, uh, flexible way now of opting out via spe certain specific works or the whole repertoire or or that's so it, there's there's it's also uh, a very uh, there are many changes there as well so so we yeah we, we certainly tackle this issue as well okay thank you thank you and presumably the um uh it's, it's an ongoing dialogue between the, the IPO and the various stakeholders um, as, as these provisions develop. I mean, I know we've hit a, a formal review point for the CRM directive, but it's a, um, I'm I mean, it's really, it's a really helpful um, indication that you've come to talk to us today and that your door, your door is open to our, to our input. So, um, so we're really grateful to you for that. Um, just, just generally, you, you ran through some of the uh, some of the provisions that you thought were most important to right holders in the CRM directive. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about uh, transparency and the uh, um, the way you think that that there needed to be improvements in in the operation of transparency in the Hungarian market? And are you seeing those those changes happening already? Yeah. Yes. Um, um... The transparency issue is is quite important. We thought this already before the CRM directive. So we introduced uh, special obligations. It was it was a, I think uh, a very uh, maybe uh, uh, Andras from 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 uh, artists who can also refer to that. It was a it was a very um, intense uh, dialogue between the CMOs and the supervisory authority. We thought that it is very important to to have up to date information about the data about uh, about how uh, the you know the the sum of amounts that were collected distributed all kind of uh, what 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 from the from the perspective of, of the bylaws is important so we had the dialogue on introducing specific tools and within this uh, context uh, we introduced uh, a special reporting obligation uh, uh, towards the CMOs which means that in every half a year they provide us huge excel sheets about all, all relevant data which we agreed on that might be important from the side of the supervisory authority so that we can not only follow um, the developments uh, as based on the crm directive every year the transparency reports which are provided but later on i mean just following more than a half year the relevant year but we can uh, up to date, see this kind of uh, 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 happening, so to say, in the market. So I think that's that's quite a good best practice, maybe, uh, uh, which we have, and uh, and we can we can already in our annual um, uh, uh, supervisory procedures ask the CMOs if we see some kind of changes in the data. We don't understand what's happening and why is that happening, so we can have a discussion based on these uh, 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 rules. So it's 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 a very important tool uh, uh, in my belief. I completely agree. Peter, thank you so much. You've you've survived your 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 time. So thank you very much. And thank you. I hope that the audience has survived as well. Uh, no, <laughs> this is what we live for. Publishers live for this stuff. So, <laughs> thank you so much. And um really for your for your the way you've displayed incredible sort of openness and pragmatism in the way you you you're seeking to implement legislation and uh, and we're very and we wish you uh, the very good fortune in your uh, in your next role uh, that you're moving into. That sounds that sounds very exciting. Um, thank you very much. So thank you, Peter. And I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. Uh, I, I, I intend to follow because it's very important that we get to know this kind of information. So if you don't mind, I stay in touch uh, here as well. Absolutely. Please do. Please do. Always welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. So um, now we move to a section of our agenda that I'm really looking forward to, actually. It's a video that uh, we've put together, a Vox Pop from uh, 
some from regional members uh, talking about the important issues for them around the region. Thank you to Jenny, particularly for her work in pulling this together. Um, and uh, we can roll VT. Thank you. On behalf of the Hungarian Music Publishers Association, uh, I want to say hello to the staff of ICMP, the co-organizer of this conference, and every colleagues of the attended countries. It's a pity that we cannot meet in person. However, <coughs> this online conference is much better than a cancelled one like last year. We try to make an agenda which this conference and every colleagues of the attended countries. It's a pity that we cannot meet in person. However, <coughs> this online conference is much better than a CEE MPC conference. Hi everyone, I'm Alkis Tisciklu, Warner Chapel Music's administrator in Greece, covering the key issues and concerning the incorporation of the European Directive to the Greek law, no bill has been published to date. From the information we have received though, specifically for Article 17, it will not go beyond the framework set out. Concerning the relationship with our local CMO, uh, even though our relationships uh, uh, with EDEM is pretty good, as you may be aware of, there are two acting CMOs in Greece. We would like to see them merge to one and accept more than one third of music publishers in the BOD and supervisory board. As a Europe member, I would also like to see publishers caring as much for their repertoire's cultural diversity, protect it and make it known to the world, as they already do for their dynamic anglo US repertoire. Concerning lasting changes from the pandemic, we expect a part of concerts income to roll over to online use and online concerts and a reduction in public performance from businesses using music optionally as they are expected to proceed without music at this time. Um, concerning the challenges in local business environment, the challenge in our territory is to convince the two active CMOs to merge and to see how a possible third player in the market will intervene for better or worse results. In Mediterranean countries, the main income is public performance and different CMOs acting in the same territory of collection only results to an overall lower income. In the broadcasting area, things are equally bad. Even though challenged nowadays, the so-called monopoly is the most efficient licensing and cost-effective way for all parties involved, as long as this monopoly is not being abused, is non-profit and belongs to its members. As a perspective, I see at least an offline strong monopoly CMO for collective management in Greece. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. It's great pleasure to have the opportunity to record this video for ICMP and to be able to share the problems of Georgian music publishing market. Georgia has a sole collective management organization with the appropriate status granted by the government and the CMO is GCA. GMI took steps necessary to ensure music publishers' possibility of becoming a member of society. We have a close and fruitful business relationship with them and working together to tackle the challenges they are facing at this moment. The biggest one being the opportunity of music publishers to be elected to the board and the development of the control mechanisms for members. Furthermore, by our close involvement, new system of reporting and management of performing rights, named MUSMUS, was developed and implemented. Uh, that will be invaluable ter in terms of development of the level of transparency. Pandemic became a big problem for music industry. Collection of performing rights as well as the sync applications decreased drastically. However, due to the fact that the music market in Georgia is relatively new and develops with a great tempo, we managed to ensure the stability of the incoming royalties. The prime problem for the past several years still is the lack of copyright awareness. In most cases, entities do not even realize that they infringe copyright. 
Therefore, prayer using applications are pretty much non-existent and we mainly operate by post-factum and retroactive penalty licensing. On the other hand, with the involvement of UIPO, we have drafted this series of changes in our copyright law to harmonize it with the EU directive and we hope that the mentioned draft will be implemented in the nearest future. If there is a value gap in any way on the planet, Georgia would be the definition of the mentioned value gap. Biggest music platforms pay next to nothing in comparison to the income they generate. As for Facebook in particular, even the in-stream ads are not available. From our point of view, the only way to tackle the issue is the opportunity of direct communication with platforms, which in the case of Georgia is extremely difficult. Didi Matvulam. As a candidate member since more than 50 years, I'm not sure if Turkey is based in the EU or not, but the value gap is our one of our basic problems, like the music publishers all around the world. The way we tackle this problem is to issue direct licenses as much as possible to the extent that the law permits. Uh, we have started with the MCS a few years ago and will be inking our first live licensing deal with one of the major concert promoters very soon. The copyright in the digital single market is not yet enacted into Romanian national law. As a result, the Commission opened the infringement procedure by sending the letter of formal notice. We currently have a very good collaboration with the local CMO, a relationship based on mutual support and good communication. We hope to see in the future more digitalization and automation of the registration and reporting procedures. As in all European countries, we see less income from live shows. I think it will take several years to see again the pre-pandemic effervescence of live events. And people will need time to return in high numbers to big events. We also see a slightly decline in TV advertising due to migration toward digital. In the close future, the music publishing industry, together with the CMOs, will need to push for a higher royalty with DSPs and find a business model to generate and collect royalties from online advertising. General lack in keeping up the pace with a fast transition toward digital music usage and the lack of transparency shown by DSPs in relationship with right holders. Hello publishers and society colleagues. What copyright directive brought to publishers in Poland is membership in Zyx after 50 years of absence in the society. Section of publishers has been created, three of us elected and one can be present in the board of in the meeting of the board of Zaix, uh, even though it is the right to be present and not the right to vote. This is temporary solution until general assembly elections because statutory publishers have two seats in the board and one in audit committee. The heading challenge for us and society is creating open communication, partnership with business environment and smooth adoption of technology to grow writers' revenues and to value, support the value of creativity and culture. Hello to all of you from Slovenia. Uh, I'll just uh, get straight to the, to the track. What is your headline assessment of local implementation of the EU Copyright Directive? Yes, we have participated in draft copyright law changes. The draft is now on the table. And we have participated with um, uh, additional comments and input on uh, draft documents. We are waiting for any reply, but as it looks, at the moment, uh, there is nothing from the Ministry. Uh, we have also no information on uh, implementation and it does not look it will happen anytime soon, at least um, not in the time, fr time frame um, uh, we ex expect. So the next thing is uh, a business relationship with your um, local CMO. Um, um, we had the last conference, uh, live conference of course, was in Ljubljana. Um, we mentioned a lot of things there um, regarding SASAS uh, and we see slight changes to better, uh, but the publisher is still not represented in the board. Um, which we think uh, should be the next um, step in uh, upgrading the relationship. So hello everybody, nice to meet you. This is Gunter Sarge from Latvia, uh, Mikrek Publishing. We don't have a 
Publishers Association here in Latvia. So uh, with this adaptation of copyright directive, it goes slow, but it goes quite uh, in a good way. Uh, the biggest discussions is about the uh, writer's moral rights, fair compensation terms, and the longest discussion were about the copyrights in programming and exploitation of uh, such rights. Uh, we have uh, excellent uh, relations with uh, our Ministry of Culture, who are leading this adaptation, and uh, as well as relations with the collective management organizations. We have discussions, phone calls, and uh, so it's, it's okay with this. And Minister of Culture is a musician, that, that makes sense. Uh, so, well, pandemic as everywhere, just worse as uh, in uh, other countries in Europe, and, and if it's live. Uh, live uh, music and it means less income from the live shows. That's it in general. Bye. Gosh, seeing all those uh, old friends in one place just makes me realize how, how, how difficult it is to be a part. So I really hope we all get together, together in person uh, next year. And thanks to everybody who contributed to that video. Um, some very important points being made. Um, so, and apologies for the technical issues. Um, that's life, that's tech. Um, but now we obviously move to something which poses no challenges at all, which is the uh, Russian music market. Um, we have a panel of experts moderated. We're very fortunate to have uh, Nigel Elderton uh, as our moderator, the European president for peer music, who in his spare time is uh, chair of PRS, just in a few odd minutes. Um, so uh, we're very much looking forward to this analysis on, on um, such an important market. So over to you, Nigel. Do we have Nigel with us? Apologies for this. Nigel, do we have you? Can you hear me, Jackie? I can hear you. Yes, excellent. Are you? Are you yeah, ready? I'm just looking. Um, uh, yeah, I've unmuted, but I'm trying to find out how I can unlock the screen. Yeah, we definitely need to see you. It'd be a shame not. That would be nice. That would be nice. Um, can anyone give me any guidance? I'm just. Hi, Nigel. Up. John here. If you can just rename yourself first of all, we can do. We can take care of that for you automatically. So, all panelists, if you have, uh, if you have a panelist link, simply just rename yourself using the three dots in the corner, and we'll uh, be able to take care of any audio or video issues for you automatically. Um, so, Nigel, Olga, Dimitri, and Lowry, if you could just look at the top of your screen and rename yourselves. Hello. Hello, Laura. Uh, it's Dmitri. Dmitri, uh, добрый день. Привет. Uh, Привет. So, uh, my, so my name is okay? Camera. Yes, if you could just turn on your camera, please. And likewise, also, if you could just rename yourself, Nigel, in the top right-hand corner from panelist link, we'll be able to uh, start the session I, automatically for you. I can't find where I can switch on my camera <laughs> i've got panelist i have a i'm on panelist link but i can't see anywhere to rename i'm sorry um i'm definitely on the panel i'm on the panelist link for sure yes me too but where is the camera switch on it's different than yesterday yeah there is no three dots here mm -hmm. There's, there am I there, Nigel Elder to Peer Music. So, Johnny, can you, can you hear me? Hi, Nigel, yes, I can hear you. It should be the link just circulated yesterday, but indeed we can just uh, resend, if we can just take a moment, if that's not working for you, that's yeah, unusual. Yeah, we, um, 
we just got a new link about 10 minutes ago, which I've used. Yes, same one. Um, so shall I come, uh, we'll just, shall I come out? And, I'll come out and come back in. Just rejoin, please. Yes. Uh, Jenny, if you could resend okay. that, please, just to make sure it's the same one. Many thanks. Okay. Me, me too, yes. Okay. Yes, please. Johnny, is it possible to start the panel without renaming? We could indeed, yes. Uh, Nigel, do we have you back? Or uh, do we have you back also, Dimitri? There we have him. I, I would suggest you turn people's cameras on and just speak without renaming. That would be great. Yes, indeed. We'll, we'll take care of that automatically. So, Dimitri, if you could kindly, and Olga. There we have everyone gathering. Lowry. Hello. Hello, Olga. Good afternoon. Not sure what happened with the technical bips there, but uh, cl glad to see you all. Uh, we'll just wait a moment for Dimitri to uh, open the other door across the corridor. Can you hear me okay, John? Loud and clear, Nigel. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Apologies to everybody for the technical hit. No problem at all. No problem at all. So we're just waiting for Dimitri to join in just a moment. Lowry, can you hear us? Lowry, can you hear us? So they've all received the same link. Yeah, definitely the link that um, Jenny sent out, I think 20 minutes or so ago. And it has been resent again. So it's uh, the same link that you have, Nigel and Olga. So yeah, that's what I choose. Yeah, it shouldn't be any issue whatsoever. They may need to come out and go back in, which is, I think, perhaps part of the problem. Okay. For what, I'm not sure why the reason that would be, but just in case, Larry and uh, Dimitri, if you are present, just reuse that link, just leave and reuse it. Uh -huh. I think we have a new attendee. Dimitri, still with you. Still got a show. You're on mute, Dimitri. We can unmute you automatically. There we go, Dimitri. Hello, Dobrydians. <laughs> Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, great to see you. And uh, we're just waiting for Larry also to join on that very same link. Hopefully not too long. No, we'll just give it just a moment and uh, we'll start making uh, some uh, introductory remarks uh, if Larry is having trouble connecting to audio. Olga, can we just test your audio, please, if you wouldn't mind just uh, speaking and introducing yourself. You're on mute at the moment, Olga. Hey, I'm here. Very good. Audio is great. Thank you so much, Olga. Let's just give it another few seconds for Lowry. Johnny, do you think it's worth um, us kicking off and then... Um... I think so, Nigel. Larry ha has the link indeed, the correct one, so there should be no technical obstacle to him joining uh, and starting. So what we'll do is we'll just... I think we have him joining now. 
Here he and is. Uh, here he is. It's like an ISWC and an ISRC linkage. Always tricky. Good afternoon, Laurie. Very nice to see you. Hello, Laurie. A oh, voice from Larry. Yes, here. Yeah. Hello, Larry. Yeah. Hey. Hi, Dimitri. Hi. Hi, Johnny. Great to see you. Sorry about the technical hitches. Great to see you all. Nigel, over to you if you may. Thank you, Johnny. Um, very much indeed. Uh, uh, apologies to everybody uh, for the technical hitches. Um, and thank you to Jackie for uh, a brief introduction, although that seems uh, a long time ago now. Um, I'm delighted to be here and joining you this afternoon, um, if only uh, online. Uh, and hopefully, as Jackie said, um, it would be wonderful to think that we could get together uh, in person next year, as I so miss uh, meeting all of our colleagues uh, in person. So uh, fingers crossed that that happens. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be moderating this panel today. Um, and I'm joined by uh, Olga Kinn from Warner Chapel, uh, Dimitri Mayo from National Music Publishers, and Laurie Reichardt uh, from IFP. Um, perhaps just to set the scene, Russia is currently the 17th biggest streaming market in the world, according to IFP, with 15 million paid streaming users. It is projected to become the 10th largest market by 2030. We've long associated Russia with unlicensed services uh, and online piracy. But as we will hear this afternoon, there has been many positive developments over past years, having taken big strides to improve copyright law in the region. So perhaps kicking off, Laurie, um, perhaps I could ask you to just give us a brief overview of the, uh, of the market uh, from IFP's perspective. Oh, um, thanks, thanks, Nigel, and uh, and and thanks first of all for for having me on behalf of IFPI and me personally. So, so thank, thank you for joining. For <clears throat> well, look, I, I think a couple of things to know really about the Russian market. As you already said, um, you know, it is the seventeenth largest streaming market, and actually, it's the, I think it's the sixteenth largest uh, market overall. And to put things in context, it, it is actually just ahead of India, which obviously is a you know, massively interesting market and we are all very, very much focused on. So, so Russia is, is number 16, India number 17. The other thing which is interesting is that last year, Russia was um, one of the fastest growing recording music industry markets in the world, um, you know, showing 33.0 percent growth year on year and um, and and it seems that 2021 you know that trend will will continue so so you know very very interesting times um, and and then if you look at the kind of the, the makeup of the market 85 percent of the recording industry revenue comes from streaming so it is it's highly highly streaming driven. And, uh, and what is interesting is that it is mainly the local <coughs> local streaming services, so uh, Yandex, VK in particular, that are, are driving driving this this growth. Uh, but then, you know, in order to give a sort of a, if you will, a complete picture, it's also worth mentioning about you know Pyrus and Nigel. You already said that you know there are some you know good good developments. Um, good, good process processes available for the the right owners, uh, such as as a website blocking through the Roskamnado, which works works pretty well. And and Olga probably is better placed to you know discuss the the details of 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 that. Um, having said that, you know there's one sort of if you will globally seen one big problem which is that those good measures and procedures are not necessarily available if you're looking at services that are established in Russia but then are, are if you will targeting markets outside the, the country. Also worth, worth mentioning the new um, mobile apps blocking law uh, which is you know used to some extent and I think also would merit in some some if you will improvements 
but as an idea, really interesting one, considering particularly how important, you know, that, that or important or, or concerning uh, app, apps piracy has, has become. Um, and then the last point, just to say, again, this is obviously from the point of view of the recording industry, the one area which is currently not working very well is, is, is the collecting society area where, where frankly, you know, if you look at, look at the collecting societies, they are not sufficiently efficient, not sufficiently accountable and not sufficiently transparent. But that was a kind of a, a just a quick quick overview from thank you. our side. Thank you, Larry, and um, I think you've uh, you've touched upon a number of issues that I hope we can unpack uh, in this brief session. Um, Dimitri, um, Larry was talking about the uh, main drivers of growth in um, uh, in digital. Um, what would you put that down to uh, yourselves? Is it the cost and availability of uh, the internet connection, perhaps, or um, or more uh, mobile services coming on stream. Uh, what are your thoughts? I think uh, the reason why the streaming and uh, usage of the mobile phones or any apps or also the music services through mobile phones is growing and continue to grow in that uh, here in Russia, I think it's very cheap internet access and the um not expensive the mobile services prices i think it's it's uh, number one reason and the second reason that um also the cheap price for the streaming music it's in rubles and it's it's i think it's cheaper than in europe or in the other countries thank you olga um again welcome to you uh, what are your thoughts um as to why the uh, streaming market is doing so well. I think I saw a statistic, um, streaming income has grown by almost 76% by end of year 2019, which if that is accurate, that seems like a phenomenal growth um, uh, during 2019. Um, what are your thoughts? I think that first of all, uh, we have a very high level uh, mobile internet penetration uh, in our country. It's uh, about 78% of mobile internet in the country, uh, considering the high, uh, vol the high number of uh, the population. It's about uh, 146 uh, million uh, of people, mm, first of all. Also, I think that uh, last time, uh, important reason is that uh, some kind of uh, big ecosystems uh, are operating in the market. For example, uh, Yandex is a full ecosystem, including music, music streaming service, or uh, VK, which also has its own ecosystem, including different products of uh, delivery and banks and and of course is Bersbook, which is based by uh, one by the biggest uh, state bank Sberbank. Uh, this ecosystem includes uh, musical service Sberbook and uh, a lot of uh, different services uh, such as delivery, taxi, uh, pharmacy, uh, shops uh, and so on. I think bank all service. and of course yes, bank service. I think all these uh, factors uh, play a big role in uh, the successful streaming development. Mm. Uh, you yes. mentioned VK, um, and I understand that VK was uh, uh, up until fairly recently um, unlicensed, um, but now is a fully um, legal streaming service, um, and that seems to have gener that's generating a lot of uh, local uh, subscriptions. How does how does VK and some of the other uh, streaming service local streaming services you mentioned compare to uh, Spotify and Apple 
uh, and these are in fact, um, I think I'm right in saying these are, was the first to launch in about 2011 and Apple, I think 2015 and, and latterly Spotify launched, I think in 2020. How do they compare with the, the local streaming services? Both for cost uh, and for yeah, as, as I know, as I know, if we are talking about uh, uh, premium users, uh, which pay for the music, uh, Wiki is on the second place in this uh, in this um, competition, if it's possible to say, and uh, Spotify uh, is on the first uh, place. Excellent. Um, Dimitri, as we're, whilst we're painting a very positive picture, I understand there are still some challenges. Is it a comp company called Telegram is still operational in Russia, uh, I think outside of the country, but it's unlicensed and unregulated. Is that something that you're looking at uh, trying to deal with? Um, uh, you're right, Nigel, uh, but Telegram, I don't think it's the name of the company. Telegram is uh, like a messenger I see. Together with the social network mechanism and uh, something else, it's uh, this service allowed to um, download music to the customers there in their um, networks. So it's um, absolutely illegal from the music side, and um, this service. I think it's uh, originally created by Russian um, specialists in the piracy field, but it's outside of based outside of Russia, and um, the the government tried to do something, but nobody knows where is it. Okay, uh, Laurie, Laurie uh, you mentioned uh, earlier on about anti-piracy legislation. Um, Obviously, that's uh, a very important to underpin um, a robust copyright uh, regime. Um, can you give us any details of, um, uh, of what's been going on there? I understand there was a law passed in 2013, uh, which was later expanded uh, to cover music in 2015. But um, can you give us any more details about um, the initiative there? Yeah, I think you're referring to the, you know, the, 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 the if you will, the blocking, blocking law Yes, and, uh, and the process that has been put in place, which offers, um, I think it's fair to say, kind of an administrative route to, to block infringing sites, uh, which has been used by by the local local companies quite quite actively. And uh, and Olga, if I'm not wrong, there are now over there are hundreds of of infringing sites that are are blocked in in Russia using this this administrative procedure and uh, and that really you know seem, seems to work work very well uh, as said the the only if you will spanner in the works is is that uh, we can't use it when we are dealing with sites that are established in russia but then with respect to their activities outside and and we do have a particular problem for instance with uh, with illegal locker sites uh, and some of the you know the most popular locker sites even globally are, are based in Russia, but we can't use this particular problem really to address that. So then we need to go, if you will, the more traditional route and try to take direct direct actions against against those those operators. And uh, and that's not always very easy, as 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 we know. On on just you know a couple of words on Telegram. I mean that's definitely becoming a you know even a sort of globally a a bigger, bigger and bigger problem. Uh, obviously, you know the service does a lot more than just just you know distributes distributes music, and uh, and and definitely something we should we should do do more about. They seem to be willing to cooperate to an extent, but uh, but more more needs to be done. And I we believe that, and I think it's correct. They are based in Dubai right now, so. Ah. Okay, I wish I'd known that uh, last week because I was there. I uh, <laughs> paid them a visit. You could have paid them a visit, yeah. Um, yeah, and just to put that in perspective, my uh, my stat statistics here say that 34% of consumers are still getting their music from unlicensed sources. 
uh, and that's from a country of 146 million people. So it's still uh, something that uh, of a challenge to us. Um, time is short, so I'll, I'll move on if I may. Um, and again, something, Lowry, that you uh, intimated earlier in your opening, uh, opening uh, uh, sort of comp uh, comments, and that is that um, uh, the Collection Society Network in, and particularly RAL um, in Russia have, um, uh, have not been uh, particularly uh, good at getting distributions out of the door. Uh, I understand that there's huge delays at the moment at the society, particularly uh, distributing international royalties. Um, Olga, is there anything that um, I know that we uh, I think we asked somebody from RAL to join us today, but unfortunately they were unable to do so. Uh, is there anything that um, that you and your colleagues um, in the publishing industry have been doing to uh, put pressure on RAL to improve distributions? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, we think that. Uh, there are still uh, some problems with distributions, starting from uh, sometimes late reporting from RAO and collective societies. And uh, sorry, starting from uh, the not so uh, good uh, system of identification, of matching, uh, of uh, musical compositions in the reports uh, and uh, finalizing with uh, delays uh, with reports from uh, collective societies. Also, uh, I think that uh, it's a still a um, big problem, for example, that uh, Rao uh, still uh, doesn't use uh, uh, identification codes for musical compositions, I, I mean, uh, see, I, I, ISVC. I, ISVC code, yes, uh, and uh, it's it's still a problem uh, because uh, you know matching by title and uh, names of author is not uh, fully correct uh, way of uh, finding the compositions in the reports. Mm. Yeah, and uh, Dimitri, any uh, are you putting pressure on Rao from uh, from your own uh, company to to uh, make the distributions more frequently, and more accurately? Yes, I think um, during the um, each uh, student period, we discussed with Rao how they. Uh, what they do to do better for the statements. And this year they switch on the um, new database, uh, song database, but um, and, and a new program to make uh, registration and statements. But uh, this is also without uh, using CWR. This is uh, not a problem, but this uh, do not allow us to make registration uh, all of big catalogs, uh, big new entries in our um, publishing contracts. It's mm -hmm. mostly for international. So uh, as I understand, they try to do what they can. And for example, they, um, they make slow uh, distribution because during pandemic, when uh, all employees sitting uh, out of office, they do not make a distribution because the uh, this works in only in office. <laughs> so they they delay on uh, six or seven uh, months, I think. Yeah, same, same problem was with uh, switching to the new system of uh, Rao. Uh, it co uh, it caused uh, some delays with reports. And it's still causing uh, delays because uh, I don't know maybe something wrong with this system. And uh, are you? Um, still some problems. Do you have, do you have any uh, knowledge of whether they are looking at some of the uh, pan industry initiatives 
that have uh, emerged from the society publisher forums, such as uh, globalized standardized cue sheets, for instance, or the, um, the new updates on CWR. Are they looking at uh, adopting any of those? Unfortunately, I don't know about uh, such an issue. Me too. Auri, um, as you raise this, um, um, is IFP um, actively uh, pressing um, for, uh, for better metadata and uh, better distribution, more regular distributions? On, on the recording side, yes, definitely. I mean, that's a, that's a high priority, you know, for our work with with the music licensing companies, as we call our, our collecting societies, right? Um, definitely, and then, and I'm I'm really happy to say that we made some some great progress in in that area, both in terms of of sort of identifying and uh, and and also including building systems that can be shared by the, our music licensing companies across the globe so that you know people are using the same standards the same systems and then also we have now a you know if, if you will a a metadata firehose um, the rdx um, recording data exchange yeah. whereby companies can inject their their metadata one point where then it will then be propagated to all the mlcs that are able to to uh to, to manage it, uh, and in the fullness of time, we believe that that's something that will be will be linked to all, all the MLCs around the world. It will take a few years, but uh, we have now the PECs in in place. I was going to ask: Is that available at the moment to uh, to uh, any record label in Europe? Yes, yes, we have we have we have all the majors, and also you know the key some of the sort of the larger larger independents, beggars, Domino, Pias. And, uh, and 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 more already already linked up to the RDX. And all you sorry, sorry, please. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 please. Okay. Or am I right in the understanding that uh, the main uh, identification uh, is for ISRC code for phonograms, right? IS, ISRC is definitely you know the, the main code, but at the same time, yeah. it's not the only one. So we use mm -hmm. also then additional additional criteria to identify identify the recordings but but you're right isrc is the you know the first one the main uh, what i see uh, from the publishing perspective uh, is that uh, uh, for publishing uh, there is no such uh, well spread uh, popular uh, code like uh, isrc for the record labels and this is a big problem for our uh, relations and partnership with DSPs, for example, because uh, all DSPs uh, identify content and uh, pay royalties only by uh, identification code. It's, it's the best and correct uh, way of uh, identification. But uh, when we talk about publishing, about uh, musical compositions, uh, we can't use uh, ISRC code in every uh, situation because there are uh, also uh, user-generated content uh, on, 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 on the service and uh, there are, and sometimes publishing company even uh, doesn't know uh, ISRC code for uh, the musical composition. Uh, the ISWC code. You don't have that? Uh, unfortunately, it's not used by uh, services and by RAW, as I said before. It, it's not popular and it's not used in fact. It, it's not used in fact. It's not so, workable. Yeah. So publishing companies have, have to match uh, their content by uh, title and uh, name of author. And of course, you know that it's it's not it's it, it's not the best way because we have a lot of disputes uh, when uh, titles uh, are similar to other titles of uh, other compositions. So, unfortunately, because of this problem, huge volume of streams remain uh, unidentifiable and with no payment of royalty. 
Well, this sounds like something that we need to uh, ask our colleagues at ICMP to look at and um, and try and work with you. Yes, definitely. Find solutions. So for the uh, to-do list, Johnny, I think. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, it seems to fly by. Um, just a couple of other questions, if I may. Um, obviously, uh, COVID has uh, impacted us all. Um, and of course, our industry uh, very badly over the last 20 months. Um, that said, your market looks set to grow again in 2020 um, with executives um, predicting strong growth in, uh, in this year. Um, are you feeling that? Are you feeling that um, you're getting back on track? Obviously, live is a main main driver to that. I appreciate, but in terms of streaming revenues and and uh, other areas, do you feel confident that uh, business is getting back to um, 2019 sort of levels? Uh, Dimitri, uh, do you mean just digital or the whole music market? Well. Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> uh, digital, uh, uh, we think that it's continued to grow uh, minimum 20% per year or uh, I think more for next year. And uh, we are waiting for the concerts when it back to the stages and we'll continue to get royalties from the big concerts from the big artists from the West. <laughs> well, we look forward to Next that. Next year we're waiting. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Um, as we've got a few minutes left, I think I'm permitted to given that we started late. Um, I'd like to throw this open to any questions that any of our colleagues that have tuned in today may have. Um, Johnny, how would you like me to deal with that um, in a technical way? Should I just look at the chat or should uh, should somebody be hosting it? Thanks very much indeed, Nigel. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to uh, to, to put in, but if, if, you, if you could just um, indeed take a little look at the chat box. We have a couple of good questions here from Paulina uh, Golba and from Johnny Lappin over in Ireland and uh, uh, a familiar friend from Scott about the huge issue of the lack of linkage between ISWC and ISRC codes. Okay. Uh, question from Alex over at Sony. Are you able to see those, Nigel? Okay, I will. Um, there's one here, I think, from Scott Barrent. Um, Indeed, that's just a, a comment. Just a comment, really. And we're, and we're back to the lack of definitive ISWC, ISRC links. Quite right, Scott. Um, just Alex, below that. Alex Batterby, uh, do RAL provide their own identifiers on these lists so that you can store repeat matches, or is it purely text to text each time? Olga, do you, do you have a, an answer? Oh, yes, man. we use uh, we use uh, Raul's code uh, and we use even uh, our own codes, uh, and of course it helps to minimize uh, as it as much as it possible uh, some repeated uh, mistakes. Okay, um, another question here from Paulina: uh, Do publishers have access? to DPS reports, which are delivered to RAL? DSP, uh, I think. DSP. Uh, DSP, DPS. Uh, the, uh, the unique situation in, uh, for Russia is that uh, DSPs are not licensed by uh, RAL and any uh, collective management organizations. Uh, all streaming is uh, licensed by uh, publishers and record labels uh, directly. So, uh, RAO, uh, of course, uh, have access to DSP's report because RAO has uh, its own uh, limited catalog for um, licensing digital. Mm -hmm. for digital. Yeah, but it's, 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 uh, this catalog is formed by uh, signing uh, of direct agreements between RAO and um, also, for example, but uh, all big uh, publishers and all big record labels uh, didn't uh, authorize, didn't authorize RAO to collect for digital. So we do, we do that directly. Yeah, understood. Um, I have a question here from Johnny Lappin in Ireland. Does Russia use 
Radip Q, Q sheets for TV shows? And is it used in other Eastern uh, European territories? Do you know of Radip Q? Actually, I'm think, not familiar. Think not. No? I don't think so, Johnny. So, um, well, as, oh, it's called, sorry, it was a, a typo. It was called Rapid Q. Um, no? Doesn't ring Doesn't matter. <laughs> no, okay. Um, is it easy for small publishers to become a member of RAL or does it have uh, very hard procedures in terms of uh, becoming a member? Uh, that's a problem. It's an, it's an old problem uh, connected, connected to RAL is that uh, the organizational uh, forum of RAO yeah. is that uh, RAO is a public uh, organization. So uh, uh, no uh, legal entity can be a member of uh, RAO, only physical uh, persons. So uh, formally uh, not. Okay, thank you. Well, you've answered that question. I think what's becoming clear is that RAL uh, really does need to up its game. Uh, I think we need to bring some pressure to bear on RAL to improve um, certainly its metadata um, and its identifiers, um, because it sounds to me as though uh, they're la lagging very far behind many societies in Europe. Laurie, um, I'm going to probably give you the last word here. Um, anything you'd like to... Um, to, uh, to say to to sort of wrap this up. No, I mean, I, I thank thanks for for inviting me and 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 thanks for focusing on Russia. As said, you know, it's it is it is one of the fastest growing music markets that we see. And uh, and and just the, the last point I would like to say is that obviously I think the next step in the development of the market must be that in addition to the if you will the traditional DSPs that the music right holders can start to efficient, efficiently monetize other, other types of, of, of digital platforms which are generating elsewhere in the world more and more revenue from, you know, from, from, from the likes of Peloton to yeah. Facebook, TikTok, and, 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 and so forth. So uh, and that comes to the point, which is we need to, we need to develop the, the online liability rules to ensure that, you know, that licensing is, is possible that the rules are clear. Excellent, excellent point. Um, my thanks, Laurie, uh, to you, Olga and Dimitri. I think, uh, I hope that like me, many of us uh, today have, have learned a little bit about, a uh, little bit more about the market. As you say, it's exciting, it's dynamic, uh, it's going to grow. And um, I think it behoves us to make sure that uh, RAL particularly, but with uh, other organizations and agencies in the region do their best to, uh, to, to push the money through quickly and efficiently and accurately, uh, and most importantly, transparently. So uh, thank you all very much for joining thank us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, back to you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank Have a nice day. You. Okay, a, a very uh, overview, and obviously an extremely challenging market in a number of ways. So, um, and but a perfect opportunity for me to trail the um, Society Publishers Forum happening tomorrow, uh, and uh, Johnny will uh, speak more about that later on. So, uh, thanks to for that panel. Now we move to what could be a very interesting discussion around collective rights management issues in Europe. Uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have with us uh, Samuel Conan, who is Chief International Business Officer for PRS for Music, and so comes to this panel with a, a very helpful international perspective on collective rights management, um, and uh, with a very esteemed panel from Poland, uh, Bulgaria and Serbia. So uh, th thanks very much for, to all of you for joining. Over to you, Sami. Thank you, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Um, as Jackie said, my name is Sammy Malcolin, the Chief International Business Officer at PRS. And we do indeed have an exciting panel on 
hot issues on collective rights management in Europe, and also the implementation of the copyright directive. Um, we have six panelists and we have 30 minutes, so we do not have any time to waste. So the less I speak, the more time we have for our panelists. And what I would propose we do is do an initial round with introductions combined with each panelist kind of laying out what they see as the key issues that we will then hopefully have some time to un unpack with a discussion after this initial round. So let's uh, get straight to it. And maybe we start with Poland and uh, Maria. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Thank you for uh, for invitation and having me here. Um, I think that I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, implementation of copyright uh, management directive into the Polish law because it changes the lines, the landscape uh, scape a lot. It introduces a lot introduced a lot of changes um, to, to to our our law, and I think it's important to bear in mind that the new act that was adopted in Poland in 2018, uh, the Act on Collective Management of, of Copyrights and Related uh, Rights is an act which is uh, ex um, has a lot of specific regulations in, in it that um, bind all CMOs uh, which are um, strictly defined in the in the uh, in this um, in this act. So this is the topic that I would like to raise and discuss with you all. Thank you, Maria. And let's stay in Poland and get a publisher view with uh, Anna. Are you here, Anna? Well, then let's uh, move a little bit. Imagine. Sorry there for me. Just to, so maybe if we could just intervene and Anna's is having some difficulties with the mic, um, but maybe if we could oh. pass to Stanislava from our colleague from Bulgaria. Yes. Thanks so much. Hi there. Hi, Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Um, uh, yes, I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, unfortunately, the representative of Music Author who was also invited our Copyright Society couldn't join. So I will just uh, present the information regarding Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, the CRM directive was finally adopted in March, 2018. In general, all the directive requirements were all implemented, um, except that in the field of broadcasting, the two collecting societies which represent music rights actually kept their exclusivity and their legal monopoly status. Uh, in the field of uh, public performance, actually, um, uh, there was a liberation of the market. For me, one of the biggest issues in Eastern Europe is the contradiction between uh, the desire of the publishers to have options and to have possibilities to opt out and then also the character of the market, which um, doesn't give us possibility to license easily. Therefore, we are permanently moving between the desire to be free and the desire to keep the society as a one-stop shop, as a legal monopoly, because this is the only way to uh, actually be successful in, in licensing. We face um, several huge problems though still. Uh, one of them is the whole procedure which is related to the approval of tariffs. So at the moment we are not able effectively to increase tariffs or to make them uh, relevant to the market situation. Um, there is a completely invalid uh, uh, procedure. And uh, yeah, therefore we are losing money every day. But at the same time, together with the CRM directive changes in the copyright law, we managed to uh, introduce several really good changes which helped us uh, collect more money from concerts, for instance. We introduced uh, a shared responsibility between venues and promoters, for example. Uh, we also introduced a new, a new administrative option for a control of uh, use of music in public performance uh, 
in, in public spaces and um, uh, created the possibility the uh, the inspectorates in the municipalities to be able to participate in the control process. Um, yeah, generally, this is a quick overview of our situation. Thank you very much, Stanislava. Um, maybe we go next to uh, Pavle in, uh, from Sokoj in Serbia. I guess the CRM directive is not uh, impacting your market very much. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone at ICMP for inviting me. And I would like to apologize beforehand because this is actually my first time participating in this type of an event. So if some stage fright strikes me, please uh, <laughs> bear no mind to it. I think I will overcome it. Um, You're doing fine. When it, when, it comes, when it comes to the current cooperative situation in Serbia, I believe that there are two topics to be addressed. On one hand, um, I, I'm afraid that there is a large discrepancy between the European Union standards and directives and our current legislation, but that is all about to change. Um, since uh, a new law on copyright and related rights is in progress to be uh, adopted, which I believe will, um, will harmonize Serbian law with 10 out of 11 directives, because at the moment when the, the whole procedure started, there were only 10 directives. And there, there's the one from 2019 on the, uh, regarding the digital single market. And everything, all of, all of the, the aforementioned, regards the Chapter 7 uh, negotiations of Serbia's joining the European Union, which in uh, that chapter relates to copyright. So that is uh, something which needs to be uh, which needs to be changed and harmonized and adjusted in order for Serbia to to complete that chapter. Uh, when it comes to industrial property, I believe that we are harmonized. But when it comes to copyright, there is some some work to be done. And I believe that one part of our today's discussion will concern. Um, possible implications of the remaining two directives which will be implemented and that's the orphan works directive from 2012 that's also the crm directive from 2014 as well as the marrakesh treaty regarding uh, certain benefits for a blind visually impaired and otherwise print disabled persons so that's that's one big topic on the other hand the second big topic and i believe that uh, my colleague Tanya Bukvic will, will address also, is uh, the, the, the situation between CMOs and publishers, which we both believe is drastically improved from the past years, where there, we were watching each other like separate sides, but uh, recent developments have shown that we are all on the same side and that we are all fighting for, uh, for right holders' rights, basically. Well, that sounds great. Tanya, will you continue from that? Yes, yes. Hi. Uh, nice to meet everybody, even if it's only uh, online. But hopefully next year we'll resume our great meetings here at, uh, uh, with uh, ICMP. Uh, so uh, I will agree with Pavle, the relationship between publishers and the society was never better, has never been better. So in 2019, uh, with the, uh, uh, the change, the first, let's say, change of the copyright law, and with the great help with ICMP, uh, we did manage uh, to work with SOC on statutory changes. So we introduced publishers, two publishers on board before uh, it was only one, and also one publisher in the supervisory board. Uh, but more importantly, we are really uh, working well together. Uh, uh, we now feel it as publishers that Sokoy has, uh, uh, can hear, uh, uh, let's say our problems and help us. The same goes the other way around, wherever. Uh, Whenever we can help the society uh, in uh, uh, establishing tariffs or uh, uh, chasing users that are not paying well and everything else, we are doing so. As for the legislation, uh, I mentioned that in 2019, some amendments to the old copyright law uh, were uh, uh, approved. 
uh, initially uh, it was thought that all the directives will be uh, implemented in our law in 2019, but then it became clear that uh, uh, a larger dialogue was needed for that and they approved just the, uh, the amendments. So now, uh, hopefully, uh, the two amendments that uh, are really regarding copyrights uh, are the orphan work, uh, orphan works one, and the uh, uh, collective management, uh, uh, the one from 2014. Hopefully, we will see that uh, we did receive the text of the new proposed law uh, a week ago. So we are now. Uh, Working on on that, we will of course uh, give our uh, remarks, uh, and hopefully by the next year we will have a, a good uh, uh, current copyright law that is uh, re that applied all the necessary copyright directives at the moment. Thank you very much. So I hope we have the microphone with Anya. Uh, fixed. And if I may, I'm going to go into a little bit more of a leading question here, given that we're talking about Poland and obviously the big development in Poland is the publishers finally being part of Zykes. Is, is that something you could comment on, Anja? Yes, that's, a, that's exciting. Thank you very much, Sami. I'm sorry for a little being, being a little bit delayed. Um, so uh, nice to see you all and uh, yes, once again, sure that it is nice news, especially because of the present presence of Mrs. Maria Boszynska, Szybowska. So publishers are members of the board of ZEIT. So this is what uh, Direct brought to us. Uh, we are uh, temporary. Uh, we, uh, we have one member uh, on, in the board, which is, uh, um, which is uh, let's say quiet presence at the meetings of the board. And uh, first of all, we have the section of publishers. This is the, with the board of five, uh, not three, I'm sorry for the, for the mistake, I was just tired. So, but, uh, and this is fantastic and we are uh, fantastic news. We are openly and nicely welcoming uh, the society. What I would uh, say is now the, the next, uh, because we stepped uh, somewhere in the middle uh, because of the problem and the issue with the General Assembly of Society. And I think this is the biggest uh, advantage and the biggest uh, thing and the biggest value uh, of the uh, European Directive. The copyright holders' presence, the copyright, fighting, uh, the copyright holders' um, right to making decisions, being uh, uh, and diversity and the equality and presence in the society. So, and that's, that means that the, this fantastic, fantastic step after 50 years of absence in, uh, of publishers in society, uh, it was done. And the, but we are in the, in the middle because uh, this uh, step could be, um, um, uh, uh, Fortunately, I hope so. After the General uh, Assembly elections, we will be fully members of the society and uh, the uh, board members in the seat of two and also the members of the co uh, audit committee. So uh, also as a manager, I want to say that the pandemic uh, time, uh, we could survive those companies who were had the finance resources uh, and also had the possibility to change fast. These companies survived. And so that's why this is so important to do further changes uh, in, in the society, societies all, not only Zykes, and to have the ability to, uh, to organize the General Assembly. This is somehow the problem I would like to ask you how other societies solve it, because this is the highest value, the transparency and the right of, of right of copyright holders, diverse and equal to make the decisions together based on realistic, uh, realistic facts. So how you uh, solve it in other territories that you have the general assemblies? And this is my question to you all. Thank you, Sami. Thank you. Would we um, 
and to go to one of our society participants for a response to Anya's question. Yeah, sure. Um, as, as Tanya uh, mentioned in, in her introductory talk, um, there, there have been certain amendments. Actually, there was a new statute of Sokoi adopted in April this year, which allowed uh, previously only one publisher was on the managing board, and that was the only actual um, presence of publishers in the major governing bodies. They were also present in, in the assembly, but the assembly of Sokoi uh, counts around 250 members. So you can imagine that there aren't many publishers and that their strength isn't really noticed um, in, in the assembly, even though um, royalty amount wise, they are very significant players. So with the, the latest developments uh, of, the, of the mentioned uh, statute, now there are two members of publishers in the managing board, and there is uh, also a single member of publishers in, in the supervisory board. So we'll see, I mean, this is, this is a relatively new development, so not many sessions were held. And I, I believe that the practice will show um, uh, that, that the presence and influence of publishers in this way might be a very positive uh, influence on, on doing business because they are really the ones who have their hands on, on the market itself and the CMO is here to mostly regulate the users. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of feel like I need to interject here as well because obviously uh, the societies and publishers working hand in glove closely together, that is absolutely critical for the success of our industry as a whole. I so completely agree. It has, it has always been curious to me why in some places there seems to be this separation between the two. So it's great to see this progress in, in, in that relationship becoming closer. If, Stanislava. If I, if, if I may add yeah. a, on top of, uh, of that a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm I think that at this point of time, the new implementation, the changes, the new statute of Zykes hope, uh, get us to the new point, uh, to the new, new, new stage in history where we have our publishers, publishers back. And answering to your uh, question, it was a matter of uh, legislature in, in Poland because our CMOs have to be uh, societies and they were, there were only natural persons in, in, the, in the societies. And implementation of the directive uh, made uh, influence such a changes in the law that made it possible to to amend the, the statute and welcome uh, the publishers again and 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 Zykes and create and create um, uh, a section a section for them. But um, let let us. Uh, let us remember that over years we had a great cooperation with with um, with uh, publishers. Uh, in the um, previous statutes, we had something uh, some, um, a co uh, publishers committee to to cooperate and uh, with 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 publishers. And I and I believe I hope that this this uh, new stage. Um, this cooperation with publishers will strengthen the society for the sake of all right holders. So I'm very, very happy and looking forward to this new, new stage. That's great. Um, before I go to Stanislaw, it's actually interesting because I, I was not aware, listening to the previous panel, that in Russia they still have that same issue where publishers can't join because they are not physical human beings. Um, but so it's great that the directive seems to have corrected that um, legal fallacy in, in, in Poland. Stanislava, you had your hand up. Yeah, just wanted to mention that uh, Bulgaria seems to be pretty civilized uh, on this uh, situation. Uh, we are members of the board for many years. We've managed to do this fight long ago. Uh, we have 15 members of the board, two, mem two of them are uh, publishers which on one side you say, yeah, it's not one third of the board, but in Bulgaria, there are not more. Uh, there are three big publishers. <laughs> so, um, and um, we have incredibly good communication in the board, our voices to be heard. 
Uh, we are asked for help. We are present to some of the biggest negotiation of the society with some of the biggest users. Our biggest problem, though, is, um, Anya, the General Assembly, because since communism, there is uh, one rule for organization which, organizations which are non-profit, which is one member, one vote. So um, the members of uh, Music Author, for instance, are over 3,000. During a General Assembly, maybe around 200 or 150. So here we are, the three of us, and uh, another 150. Uh, so it depends how loud we are, how reasonable our arguments are. Um, and yeah, usually we go prepared, but this is still a challenge. But as overall, there is a really civilized communication between society and publishers, complete transparency, no barriers in front of information. We are asked for support on several issues being digital licensing, licensing of users. So yeah, still challenges, but life is getting better. Well, it almost sounds to me like Bulgaria is the model for all the rest of us. So that's, uh, that's great to hear. So if we uh, stick with the CRM directive, obviously that is the hot item that you guys have all identified. Um, could I ask you to identify what you see as the single biggest accomplishment that it did? Obviously we've already identified the legal changes that have enabled publishers to join the boards of societies. But apart from that, which, which ones of the provisions do you see having impacted the world around you the most? We um, start with Anya. Uh, well, we have started in rights uh, only last month. So actually, um, it's hard. I, I, I cannot say from a practical point of view. Uh, oh, my, my apologies. So Poland has just now implemented it. Yes, and uh, ah. this is, as I said, this is temporary solution, only one publisher on the board instead of two, which is statutory yes. uh, in the statute of, uh, of ZAIX. So until General Assembly will be organized, and we are waiting for it since a year, so that's why I ask oh, yeah. other colleagues how, but to, uh, how they organize it, because as far as I know, everyone here is already after General Assembly organized this year during pandemic. Uh, it, was, it hasn't happened in Zeit, so any decisions made are just um, made in the, as the special circumstance, not in the just properly as it is said and in the statutory. So that's why I asked this question. How you, yeah, how you were able to, how you did it because I know you did. So let's see how we can solve this. Very interesting. Stanislava, you heard that? Uh, yeah, we had a little window in the, in the summer when the situation was a little bit more quiet. So there was a physical general assembly. And uh, so uh, there was another one planned for the end of uh, October, which was, which was canceled because the situation got worse and we are in the middle of a fourth wave here in Bulgaria. And um, so yeah, in, 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 the, in the, between these uh, situations, it's the, board of directors, which is taking most of the decisions, but there were all sorts of complications because of that, like, uh, for instance, voting the financial reports before um, publishing them and, and so on. So, uh, yeah, we managed to have, uh, you know, um, a physical general assembly. We managed just to slip in between the critical months and uh, yeah, uh, there was a uh, there was a need to choose a new board of directors as well, which uh, also happened, and therefore there was a real urge to do a physical uh, a physical meeting. Of course, uh, keeping all their um, recommendations, like we were in a bigger hall, for example, where there could be space between all the seats and everybody was with mask and so on and so forth. But we had a physical one. Yeah. So when was the directive implemented in Bulgaria? 
It was in March 2018, but uh, most of the changes that were introduced with the directive already happened several years ago because there were such fights between users and collecting societies that uh, some rules needed to be uh, introduced. Uh, so um, several of the, of the, of the um, changes that we introduced were already existing. And paradoxically, I can tell you that we found one very negative uh, tendency, actually, based on the uh, implementation of the directive. Uh, the liberation of the, um, of the public performance market led to the appearance of several uh, private legal entities which started licensing uh, royalty-free uh, music. And therefore, um, both societies, the copyright and the neighboring societies, started losing money. Um, and so it was, no, it was not all roses uh, based on the implementation of the new directive. Our markets are generally not willing to pay for music. This is a very, I think, Central and Eastern European problem. And uh, therefore, whenever a little loophole appears in the law, there are hundreds of monkeys. I can, I, I can assure you that that's not an Eastern European exclusive concept. Licensees not wanting to pay for music is a global phenomenon. I can, I can guarantee you that. Um, yeah, so this is the problem which appeared after the implementation. Otherwise, everything else was more or less existing and we have solved all the dramatic issues with the positioning of publishers, with transparency, and, and, and so on. So, yeah. Thank you. And I am being conscious of time. I think we still have a few minutes, given that we also um, started a bit late. Um, I apologize for my ignorance, but I'm, I'm now a little bit uh, baffled by the fact that Poland only implemented the directive so recently. Was there a specific reason for that? Uh, if, if I may, uh, the implementation took place in uh, June 2018. That was the, the month when the new act came in, uh, was, uh, was uh, enacted, the Act on Collective Management of Copyrights and Related Rights. And then the collective management organizations had um, nine months from the effective date of the act to amend the statutes, to adapt terms and conditions for concluding the um, and terminating the agreements with, with right holders and to, to adapt agreements to the requirements laid down by the by the act. So it was a process that that uh, that took uh, took time. And but all of Polish CMOs fulfilled, uh, fulfilled their duties and revised the documents, including statutes and practices, because the the, the new act on collective management introduced great, great changes. Um, as an example, I may say that in 1994, when the Act on Copyright uh, um, came into force, it had only 10 articles about collective management. There were basic rules for collective management. So uh, CMOs were acting on the basis of general civil rules and those 10 articles. And now our, our Act on uh, Collective Management is 142 articles and very, very specific procedures and um, requirements, obligations. So it, it, it was a great process to implement the, the, the act uh, to, to, to actions of uh, um, C CMOs in Poland. So the new statute of, of ZAIX uh, was uh, registered by the court in December 2019. So just before the, 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 the pandemic. Um, it changed it, it. changed the um, the structure of the of the or, uh, organization. Changed the membership um, uh, me membership. Ch changed a lot. Of, a lot <laughs> almost everything. A lot of things changed. So still, we are somehow in the in the process of implementing that that new rules that were that were adopted. And uh, in my opinion. Despite the adversities of the of the pandemic, we are in a we are going do, doing great job in, in implementing 
change, uh, changes resulting from the implementation of the act and implementation changes resulting from that, <laughs> from that implementation of uh, directives. Thanks for that explanation, Maria. If we then end up uh, and we go back to Serbia, um, where I believe you guys are in the process of harmonizing your laws with the directive, even though obviously Serbia is not yet a member state, um, how is that process looking? Yes, uh, let me answer that. Uh, we are not a member state, but uh, we have uh, to adapt our uh, laws to European Union directives in order to pass those uh, 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 milestones in order to be accepted uh, as a possible member to EU. Uh, even though uh, uh, the uh, collective rights management directive is yet to be implemented in our law. There's uh, uh, already uh, we're already seeing benefits. As I told you, we did manage to change the statute of the organization, and uh, even with the pandemic, to answer uh, Anja's question, uh, we did everything uh, uh, in online sessions uh, of, uh, of the general assembly. Uh, and it was really a great success because usually only, uh, let's say, a fourth of members of General Assembly uh, came to physical sessions and voted. And uh, instead, when we had uh, online session, uh, almost all members were present and voted. So we can say that uh, the statute was approved with the majority of votes. So that was even better. The statute also says that it is possible to hold uh, online general assemblies. And uh, of course, there are some members that are disputing that. Perhaps Pavla can explain the problems that uh, Soko is having uh, uh, regarding this issue. Maybe we'll give the final word to Pavla then. Mm -hmm. A way to go. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, Tanya, for for uh, a very nice uh, summation of the the recent developments uh, here in Sokoy. As as already explained, yes, uh, we have been able to hold the, the electronic session of the, the General Assembly uh, after consultations with our intellectual property office and to adopt the new statute, which indeed does enable us to to hold these sessions uh, both live and electronically i mean online if if needed um and i'm i i think i actually missed the, the main issue you man mentioned uh regarding the problems we are currently facing uh do you mean regarding the the, the implementation of the uh directive itself or regarding the some current no, uh, business? Uh, I was talking about uh, several members uh, uh, of the organization that are disputing uh, online general assemblies. Uh, did they take any legal action against the society? Oh yeah, that, 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 that's the thing. So yeah, as, as I said uh, in, uh, in the beginning, we had um, a acknowledgement and approval of the IPO, which is a supervisory uh, state body for Sokoy. And we we believe that that was enough to make to make the uh, the whole thing legitimate, and also uh, we reminded all of our members and interesting parties uh, that even though there was a very strong will to to make a live live uh, assembly, it was just not possible as as uh, certain bylaws for uh, of which were in force at the moment and were continuing um, for forbade people to to gather I, I believe in more than 10 people in the same closed closed space so that was uh, that was one thing and we really didn't want to, to take our chances with some potential other state bodies to organize uh, su such a such a large meeting regardless of how many people would actually come because it was it was not a, not just a legal but a health risk as well. And on the other hand, uh, we were thinking about uh, the, the financial position of many right holders, many of whom, when we're talking at least about uh, songwriters, but also about publishers, were really depending 
on, on the distribution of, of funds because currently SOCRI is only uh, doing uh, annual distributions. We are aiming to, to adapt and to improve our information systems so we can make more, more frequent distributions and the statute as well as the distribution plan provides such possibilities, but we are still on the technical side um, while we get there. And um, having in mind that, that many, many uh, ride holders, songwriters, etc., haven't really received any, any funds save for certain extraordinary payments. Um, and and uh, uh, holding of a session is very important because it's kind of a prerequisite that, that the assembly uh, adopts both the, the financial uh, statements and, and the future plans. That was a prerequisite in order for them to receive funds. Yes, you you raise your hand, Tanya. Yes, just quickly. Uh, I'm so yeah, we need to, to be uh, quite brief. Yeah, yeah we are really brief. Over time. I just wanted to say to Anya and all our other friends in Poland, there will always be opposition uh, within the society, opposition to publishers, opposition to change, but be persistent. Stanislav will agree with me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure, but be persistent, and you will succeed. That is very well said, and what a fitting ending to this session. Um, in terms of general assemblies, I do have to say on, on, on my own behalf that um, while we will have obviously physical general assemblies going forward, hopefully um, having them hybrid and having the ability for membership to also take part virtually, I believe is something that has to be a standard procedure going forward at PRS we've seen a completely different level of engagement by our membership um, to the two virtual AGMs that we've had to have in 2020 and 2021. Um, but I want to thank my panelists. Very interesting conversation. Thank you for educating me. There are several things that I learned that I did not know before. So I want to thank everyone and thank you to the audience and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person somewhere sometime soon. Back to you, Jackie. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everybody. Very interesting discussion. And from that, I'm going to take as a strap line Stanislav's statement that publishers should be loud and reasonable. And I would perhaps add to that and reasonably represented. That's all. That's a, so thank you, thank you, everybody, for, for your contributions. Um, and now we move to the final panel of the day, which is our focus on our host territory, Hungary. Um, we have a, an excellent panel lined up for you. Uh, just to, there we go, just to run through them quickly. Um, Adele Dennis, who joins us as the music director of the Pitofi Cultural Agency, which is a prominent national body uh, fostering interest in Hung Hungarian arts, uh, particularly for international audiences. Uh, Mitko Chatobashev, who is known to many of you, a friend of this conference from the Regional Director of Europe from CISAC. Um, Dr. Tundes Moses Siva, you've met already, co president NPA Hungary, uh, GM of UMP Hungary. Gustav Stiedl, also co president NPA Hungary, Schubert Music Publishing. Dr. Andres Singer, thank you for joining us, Andres, CEO of Artesius. And Antal Baronke, who is an uh, ICMP board member and Artistic Director of EMBZ in Hungary. So thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, just to give a, a few quick stats about Hungary, uh, sits at number 25 in the CSAC Collections report from 2020, obviously based on figures from 2019 and therefore still showing growth at that stage of 0.5%. Digital is the fastest growing revenue source. Spotify, Spotify launched uh, 2017, YouTube Music 2019, Apple Music and Spotify both have editorial teams operating locally, um, uh, but obviously the impact of COVID has had a significant impact with uh, delayed releases, cancelled festivals and musicians visibly being forced out of their profession, tragically. Um, so enough from me, let's find out more from our expert panel. Um, staying with the COVID, COVID impact uh, analysis, could I start with Andreas? Uh, could you perhaps describe for us the impact of COVID uh, on Artesia's collections, but also if you're able to, whether you have forecasts of uh, how things are looking at the moment, whether you're climbing out of it or what, what stage the market's at at the moment? Yes, hello everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Can you hear me well? 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, starting with the uh, 2020, uh, well, as all around the globe, COVID hit really hard the Hungarian market and uh, first and foremost the live uh, and uh, background music market. So, basically, uh, the lockdown uh, immediately resulted in a, in a huge loss. As in any other country, I believe the, this, uh, this sector is the first hit last out. Uh, we still, uh, for the time being, there is no general lockdown, but still some events are not allowed uh, over a certain amount of participants. <clears throat> uh, we had altogether, artists just had a, around uh, minus uh, 15, 16% uh, result. Uh, which is very close to the average uh, centuries to European music uh, society statistical average loss. Uh, I have just checked it with Mitko a couple of days ago. Uh, and most of it comes from the live and background uh, public performance market, which I, speaks for itself. I mean, it's, uh, it, it was a complete lockdown for months, um, starting in, in uh, March and then uh, Q4 was basically all the time closed down. So, so it's a huge amount of loss. Uh, what we did is we tried to uh, uh, cope with the loss of revenues uh, on the cost side as well. So we had to cut some stuff, uh, delay some um, um, some other costs. Uh, so. More or less, I would say that we managed to do it without the without uh, uh, having a astronomic uh, admin cost rate. Our admin cost rate was uh, below the the uh, um, CE and below the EU average uh, last year. I have just uh, had a meeting with the members and I told them these numbers, so that's why I'm that's why I can remember them. So. Uh, that's the general picture. And for this year, uh, our perspective is that there was a big delay in the opening up uh, in the Hungarian market. So basically the whole live sector just became open uh, June, early July. Tourism uh, only from August, which is a really, really big stab in the back uh, of the revenues because the hotel sector is a very important one for artists. Generally, I would say that artists is traditionally strong in public performance revenues. So that's why it was quite significant that we had uh, this loss last year and, and this year. But more or less, it seems that we would probably close the year with, uh, with uh, reaching the, the business plan for this year. Okay, well, that, that's good news. Just uh, just a super mini question. What is your average commission rate, please, Andres? So you've done, just done an analysis of that. This year, it, it used to be, uh, there's an efficient rate, which is calculated by the local supervisory authority. That's 14.7 uh, was last year. I mean, uh, 19, 2019. And 2020, it was, it raised to 18.7. Okay, thank you. That's useful context. Um, so coming now to Adele, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sorry we're running over slightly. I know you're, you're tight for time, so we'll make good use of you while we have you. Um, Adele, can you tell us um, what, uh, what mitigations and measures that you were able to bring to, to, to set off against the COVID impact? What funding uh, could you make available during that time? Hello, thank you. So I must leave uh, on 30, so I will start my uh, with what I am prepared about the strategy of the Hungarian popular music industry. So pop music belongs to everyone. Our common value is the Hungarian pop music, which has an elementary place in the discourse about culture. The agency declares the rank of this cultural role of pop music and the need to show its values. We consider pop music as the most influential branch of art, which do its peculiarities quickly and organically find its audience and addresses its members from the youngest age group to the older generations. 
It is important to see clearly that the popular music culture is a force that shapes society and the culture of phenomenon that can transform even demographically diverse groups into an open value-centered European thinking community. The strategy empathizes the need of cultural education of our society, be it in instrumental education, songwriting camps, or even the social science interpretation of popular music culture. The strategy calls this process socialization, which in this context means both cultural mission and social responsibility. The five-year plan constitutes of these pillar points, socialization, talent search, education, export of Hungarian music, establishment of the musical career model, and development of the communicational infrastructure. Each of these tasks tackle extremely important and neglected areas of the industry and the agency's mission to realize them with the fullest potential. Our mission is to enable bands representing our national values to prove their talents beyond national borders to foreign music loving audiences. We aim to bring the Hungarian pop music to the most prestigious international venues. Our task is to serve as an intermediary for the interest of the Hungarian pop music, and the same time to ensure that both Hungarian authors and professionals mastering their crafts have access to cross-border up-to-take up knowledge and network. Our long-term goal is to create an extensive and diversified international infrastructure to the pop music industry on which all industries of the profession can count on and build in further together. Continuous professional discourse with the participation of industry professionals of artists related to pop music culture is a necessity. An important step in socialization is the creation of formal state recognized and supported musical education, which encompasses and stimulates everything from childhood instrument selection and the conservatory system to the still missing higher education institutions and to the doctoral school. Talent search and talent management is the system of talent researches in Hungary, is supported by the Joy of Music program, like Örömö Zene program, with the professional support of the Hangfoglaló program, which also became a prelude to the musical career model coordinated by the Petofi Cultural Agency. It is necessary to ensure greater publicity and wider access for the artists of the Hungarian pop music life. It is essential to rebalance our presence on social media platforms and we consider the cultural programming structure of our radio and the quality of music of addition to our offline publications. The Petofi Cultural Agency operates along the urban above mentioned points in order to fully implement the spirit of a program of the strategy of Hungarian popular music industry. Thank you. So I think I must leave now, but I am so happy that you get that and thank you for the invitations. And I think uh, Gustav, you will help me if you will have some questions and I will come write it down on email, everything about our programs if it's necessary. Thank you so much, bye. Thank you, Adam, much appreciate Bye-bye. Okay. And the, the kind of work Adele is talking about is fundamental in our industry, isn't it? Building the, uh, building the skill sets within schools and the educational process to keep the talent pipeline flowing and, and invest in, in, in our culture. So um, very grateful for her, for her um, input. So uh, moving back to the, I'm going to go to the publishers now, give you very patient. Um, perhaps you can you can tell about your experiences of um, COVID where it hit the worst and whether you're seeing recovery already in your numbers or whether you're you think there's there's more still to come. Um, perhaps Gustav, could you start with your your input? You are muted. Sorry, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> so this. Uh... This whole situation with, with, with COVID and this, this pandemic really, really hit, hit us uh, very, very hard. As um, 
uh, Andres also told previously that in 2019, uh, also the collective system and also the collections uh, just came to a very, very high level and also the, the income was, was very, very good, better than, than even before any time. And it just dropped, yeah, fifteen percent for art issues, but but for for us it, it was it was even even more unfortunately. And uh, as we see the, the the feedback that it's not that quickly coming back than, than we we saw it at the beginning of uh, two thousand twenty when this whole thing this nightmare started. Uh, the situation is that as we we learned. Um, many of the, the habits of the music uh, users have changed. If, if you just come to concerts and live events, uh, previously it was uh, very possible that uh, the promoters and the bands could, uh, could count on the pre-sales and, and they had some information about what they can expect. Uh, now it's totally changed as, as we, we see that people just decide to go, it, Beside, of course, some very high acts, but uh, but generally people just decide in the last minute uh, if they go to a, a venue or to a concert. It's still very important that they should be uh, vaccinated in, in Hungary, but is close to 60% of the population, but uh, it's still it's it's still not enough as we see from, from the numbers and uh, uh, the visitors of, of the venues. Um, but we hope it will it will change uh, a bit more fast. But I still believe that it will come back maybe in four or five years to the point that we that we left it in 2019, 2020. Wow, that's that's a that's a long runway. Um, yeah. Uh, also, there is a there is a research that just came out. It was published some a week, or maybe that one third of the professional musicians uh, decided uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, close downs, decided to, to find other solution for uh, earning money because they, they had to. And uh, one third of them uh, also decided to, to stay with music as a, as a hobby only. And they were the, the professionals. Yeah. So, okay, thank, thank you, Gustav. And of course, um, Classical is, is very important in Hungary and, and has been very, very badly hit, especially in, the, in terms of rental uh, revenues. Um, Tunde, do you want to comment on that rental? Yes, this was the first uh, impact we, we felt immediately uh, at the first lockdown, that as the concert life was locked down, uh, uh, we didn't have any uh, revenue from the rental materials. But we had the same work with the cancellations. So uh, uh, there was a lot of administration uh, with the cancellation, but no money at all, uh, at least for four months. And uh, then there was um, an opening at the end of uh, uh, around September, October last year, um, the concert uh, life uh, seemed to be started again, but then the other lockdown came. But for that time, uh, a situation a bit changed because all the concert organizers and orchestras uh, uh, realized that uh, uh, they can stream uh, the concerts. And so the second lockdown was not uh, so serious uh, for the revenues of uh, rental uh, uh, materials because uh, the concerts were had, uh, uh, as I remember, about six from ten, and uh, it was uh, streamed into the, on the online space, mm -hmm. and. Um, and so this compensated, uh, compensated a, a, a bit uh, our losses, but, uh, but uh, as Andras mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, the opening was very late in, in Hungary. So uh, practically in the second half of the concert life, uh, every concert room was closed. And uh, uh, the opening started just, uh, 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 in, in the territory of classical music uh, uh, around September. 
And of course, we expecting, uh, uh, so if there were uh, no other lockdown in Hungary, we, we are expecting uh, a good second half of the year, but uh, uh, we have to count with all of our plans and, and, uh, and revenues uh, that the orchestra concerts were uh, uh, minimized at least for, for uh, five months, if you count the two, the last two years. And uh, uh, we will see the impact of the, ro of the uh, royalties on the side of the royalties next year, because there is a delay or, or a time gap uh, between, the, uh, between the collecting of the, of the, uh, um, of, of the, of the royalties and, and the real concept line. So, uh, as far as I uh, as far as I know, uh, we have to expect that still in the in in 2022 we will uh, we will feel uh, the impact of the of the COVID. Okay, that that's very helpful. I mean, Mitko, is that does that match the patterns you're seeing across Europe? Is Hungary suffering a slower recovery than other places? Uh, sorry, the line was not really good. Could you please uh, uh, repeat? Sorry, I, I, I was asking Mitko to, to reflect on what you've all just said in terms of your the depth of your suffering and, and the length of runway out of your recovery and whether that was slower perhaps than, than in other countries in Europe. Thank, thanks, Jackie. And uh, really appreciate to have the possibility to join again this uh, forum, which is one of my preferred ones, as you said, and I believe I missed only one edition, maybe the first one. And uh, regarding COVID impact, we are just uh, uh, very soon, CISAC will publish uh, its global collections report. And uh, just before Europe on a, on a global scale, actually the 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 decline in collections globally would be not that big as we initially forecasted or based on what societies uh, were telling us at the very beginning of the of the covid crisis and initially we were forecasting between uh, 25 20 to 35% but it seems it will be uh, much uh, smaller on a, on a global scale of course not equally spread there is a big drop in 2020 in the life sector and general licensing up to 45%. And this is particularly relevant for the European countries. And because this has been always a very traditional, uh, a, a very well-developed uh, revenue source for, uh, for European countries. So they have been all hit by the, by the basically uh, stopping the life and uh, and uh, sector and uh, different lockdowns on that had impact on the record sector digital globally would uh, have increased of course but not in central and eastern europe and maybe we talk a bit later on this on the impact on of, of the dcm directive digital continues to be a fourth source of income at least for central and eastern europe after tv uh, uh horeca sector and private copying. So digital in Central and Eastern Europe is about uh, 2020 is about uh, 20 million euros and private copying is still 60 million euros. So uh, the potential of digital is uh, still uh, not at, at the scale of a global increase that Sizak is seeing in Central and Eastern Europe. And maybe we discuss a bit the reasons later in the panel. Yeah, well, maybe maybe we go to that now because there's a you know, there's a direct link, isn't there, between recovery and growing sources of revenues, and digital is the key source of, of growing revenue. So um, that's obviously also been a massive challenge for societies in adapting to to the uh, the processing challenges and the capacity for processing challenges. So, um, Andres, do you want to perhaps tell us how? Um, how Artesius has adapted in the digital space, what changes you've had to make, how you think you're coping, and then uh, we'll give a right to reply, I think, to the publishers to, uh, uh, to, to say if, they, if, if your perceptions match their practical experiences. So perhaps you can tell us what, what measures you've been taking. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, the publishers 
probably uh, would feel the same what artists feel because the publishers, the major publishers at least, together with the big collecting societies, uh, have withdrawn their rights from artists in terms of digital many years ago. So basically what we can do in digital is to track and hound down the Hungarian repertoire, what we still represent in digital, which is uh, as high as like half percent when it comes to uh, the usage reports, what we're getting. We get the same usage report as every collecting society gets, uh, the whole EMEA uh, territory, or in certain cases where we do multi-territorials for the whole world. So basically, uh, we had to uh, find out how on earth it would be possible, feasible, and financially sustainable to represent the local repertoire in, in uh, terms of the digital. Uh, when it comes to VOD, it's a bit easier because the, the VOD services, are, I would say traditionally uh, um, existed on a longer run, but uh, music streaming services, with music streaming services, uh, we, we really had a tough time. I think it's a general problem all over the world that the uh, quality of data is poor. Uh, we on the top, we have this very, very tiny repertoire to be uh, represented using a very specific language um, set and, uh, and characters and things like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's really the challenge of these days and the last, last years. Uh, naturally, we heard uh, we heard the, the words of time and we tried to uh, use the um, concentration on the back office side. So we uh, artists as a member of Harmonia, we're trying to um, we're trying to use services together with other collecting societies to use economies of scale. Uh, try to aim, aim uh, a situation where we, uh, where we use the synergies between uh, the different societies, because once we have to do the carve outs, uh, it, it makes sense to join other, other societies and, and do the work only once. But Harmonia is not, I would say it's not in a good condition now to say, to say uh, this a bit euphemistically or it's, it's in a suboptimal state of existence. So to say I'm not, I don't know what the future will bring, but uh, it's a huge burden of investing into local systems that, and that, that is what we always wanted to uh, avoid because uh, if 27 societies invest in 27 systems, then uh, we end up meeting with you guys asking why the hell we are doing this. And it, it perfectly makes sense. Uh, I believe that this, this is something small and medium-sized societies we have to walk, work on. Uh, so that's what we're in. We are doing distributions, uh, but this only for the local repertoire. Okay, thank you, Andres, and thank you for your, for your candor. I mean, there are big challenges in this space. I mean, for the publishers, obviously, this has impacted your business as well. Perhaps you can talk about um, your interactions with Artesius, your experience from, from the efforts they are making in the digital space. Tunde, do you want to start? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, uh, of course, uh, the the new um, copyright uh, directive uh, uh, made a lot of changes also in the Hungarian copyright law. But before that, I should mention that uh, uh, not only the con the stopping of the concert life uh, was dangerous for the music publishing in the uh, in, in the COVID era, but also the uh, illegal copying. Of, um, of sheet music uh, because immediate the, the education the music education immediately went to the online space and immediately everybody started to copy uh, and using in the dig digital space uh, the, the sheet music even the, the protected one 
And uh, uh, that's why it was so important uh, when the copyright law uh, was implemented into Hungary. Uh, maybe you remember that Peter Labodi mentioned that there were a lot of consultation, even with the publishers. So uh, we had a success uh, uh, to, to make an exception uh, of the digital using of protect, uh, protected sheet music uh, uh, in the online space, and even not for, for uh, pedagogical purposes. So uh, uh, this was very important because uh, if, uh, if we couldn't uh, achieve that, uh, uh, it would be um, uh, the end of the, of the Hungarian pedagogical uh, uh, publication business. So, um, uh, the, the Hungarian copyright law was not uh, was strict in that case anyway before, uh, uh, and uh, we had a we had a fear before the implementation of the new copyright law that it would be it would be legal uh, uh, to using uh, uh, sheet music uh, on the digital uh, uh, space uh, uh, after the new law, but. Uh, uh, we, we succeed, it, it was a success to, uh, to, to convince uh, the, the, uh, the, the people at the uh, Ministry of Justice that uh, uh, it should be avoided. Thank you. May, may, I, may I add something? Yes. Uh, our publishing house is, is a sheet music publisher mostly. And we supply the Hungarian music schools 90% with our sheet music, mostly pedagogical items. So during the pandemic, we, we realized that our loss was more than 30% because of the online education. So that's why it was very important, as Tünde mentioned, that the fifth paragraph of the copyright directive, how they implemented in Hungary. So uh, thanks to Labadi, Mr. Labadi, uh, and thanks to the Hungarian Music Publishers Association, who made strong efforts lobbying in this case, uh, the, the new law uh, turned to our, our uh, benefit. That, that is, uh, according to the new law, the schools must have a permission from the publisher if they want to teach online. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's bound to a, a compensation and, and the size of the compensation, of course, is, is depends on the, on the two parties. So at the end, it became a success story. Yes, but we will see, you know, the devil is in the details. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, I'm afraid that uh, all of the sheet music, which was scanned and uh, put in the servers of the music course, will not disappear uh, in, in, the, in the short, uh, short run. Yes, yeah. yes. So that's very interesting. Um, moving back to, to um, probably the, the main focus for a lot of people in the room on the copyright directive is Article 17. So. And just and because I'm, uh, Hungary was so quick in transposing, maybe we have some behavioural uh, traits we can already identify. So, Andres, have you seen any any changes in licensee behaviour following Article 17? Actually, uh, it's not it's not Hungary where it's going to start. I have to tell you, all these big giants are, are doing their negotiations at a different level. We had, uh, I think, we had an approach from uh, SoundCloud asking about our general approach. Of course, we, uh, we gently uh, uh, try to accommodate the tariffs to the, to the new reg uh, regulation, but I have to admit that uh, I, as a, as a, as a um, I used to be a copyright lawyer, that's what I'm saying, but still, uh, I have to tell you that before the change of the legislation, I think the Local Copyright Act could be interpreted in a way that the, the uh, uh, liability of platforms were, could be already, um, uh, could be already, so they could already qualify as users. Naturally, it helps a lot that now there's a uh, um, Europe-wide uh, legal basis and they cannot, uh, cannot uh, go and uh, tell that they are just a postman. <clears throat> but I believe that the general behavior will 
uh, change once uh, the big negotiations, uh, which are which are being done at the quite uh, quite biggest marketplaces, will end. And so Hungary is uh, is more like a follower. Yeah. Okay. N noted. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. So. Um, I mean, literally, uh, we've, we've started late, we're running late to so two more questions. We'll just finish up on the CRM directive, um, asking the publishers which, um, which are the most important provisions for you in relation to the CRM directive so far in Hungary? What, what measures have you seen most effect from? And uh, Gustav, perhaps you could give us your high level comments on, on the impact of the CRM directive in Hungary so far. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, if I'm not muted, no. Okay, uh, I, I believe before uh, CRM Directive had to be implemented in, in, in Hungary, uh, our society, our artist use was very, very close to it. So no, that much change had to, had to be done. Of course, we could uh, come to the board if, if there's only one publisher uh, and, and more, more authors, but um, here we should uh, also get in the focus that with, with art issues, with the, the stuff of art issues, we have such a good communication and, and cooperation that also they, they, they help us a lot to, to, uh, to work on it. Uh, even if we are not in the board, the more than one publisher and we cannot vote, but uh, we can have a, a side and how to say advisory publisher in the board who can, who can sit there and also uh, can say and then advise stuff cannot vote, of course. But but also there is an, another uh, meeting point with art issues where most of the publishers and the main publishers can sit down together with the management of, of art issues and uh, we can discuss the, the main uh, business topics there. Um, from the other point of view, uh, we always try to fix this or from up perspective fix this but from the artist's uh, view maybe just to, to change it to have to have more publishers but we should also consider that in Hungary uh, it's a very tiny market not only as, as a digital field as, as Andres mentioned that uh, it's also a problem that there are no local uh, DSPs uh, but also publishers we are only a few so we somehow we, we, we cannot fulfill uh, the, the places. Of course, to have one more publisher in the board would mean that we have more, four more publishers in, in the- uh, General assembly. Assembly. Not, not the assembly, but uh, it's the what practical. What's the name of this? Uh, delegate council. Yeah, the delegate yeah, council, yeah. Which, is, which is very, very hard to fill because we also have um, a publisher, an active publisher, in the controlling board of art issues. Uh, and also there is 30 registered members, publisher members of art issues. Uh, from these 30, the active publishers, which are not authors related, I mean, not only kind of- um, um, Self-publisher. Text, text, uh, <laughs> text. Focused on one composer. <laughs> yeah, focused on one composer, not real publishers, I, I mean. Uh, it's it's only fifteen or sixteen, so um, it's 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 not easy. But the communication and cooperation with the society is is great. Of course, from time to time and from from year to year, we try to change this. Uh, and it's the board of of the authors um, mainly vote against us. Uh, we should be stronger, maybe, somehow, to change this. Uh, but I don't see now the, the possibility at this moment. Mm, I don't know how you see it, uh, Antal, as you, you sat on the board for, I don't know how many years, but yes. at least eight. Uh, you, you, was... also, you also fight it. Uh, yes, I, I, I also as, fight as, it. As, as also in the last year. And, uh, it, it, it comes and I fall point. down with that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, legally, legally, it was only a recommendation from the uh, European Union, not a debt directive. That's why the Assembly General didn't take as a, as a, as a must. So uh, 
On the other hand, uh, during my my present at the board, we can we can work very good together. And and it was only one or two issue when I didn't understand uh, the decision. So uh, I I I of course wanted to to widen the presence of the publishers in the board, but. Uh, this way, as we, we worked, it, it, it worked very well. Thanks. Okay, so, so Andres, you have, to, you have the final word on this. It's fair you have a, a right of reply. So fr from just for, as an outsider to hear that there is one non-voting publisher associated with the board, that, that sounds a bit odd in terms of- No, uh, no, there's one voting, one voting and there can be another one present. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Out of how many? Ten is it? How many? We have ten. ten members. Ten members in the board, but one of them is not musical. It's literary. So out of the nine musical members, there's one uh, publisher. Okay. But but uh, but that's a universal representation. Do you do you have any? Because it's universal. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I am the one that is yeah. yeah. and, and if and, and if yeah. Gustav comes, then another three publisher will be in the board at least. Two. Two. Okay. No, two. So to 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 uh, to answer the question seriously, yes. Uh, um, I think it was 2007 when uh, the question was in front of the General Assembly. Uh, the publishers did their homework and they tried to push for it and they have been trying since then. That time, uh, the management also did their or our homework. This was a year before I, I became the CEO because we organized a meeting before the vote with the members and having a, uh, offering a possibility to the publishing community to explain to the members who will vote who would vote? Why is it important to have more publishers in the in the, in the board and in the time than in the, the um, delegates uh, meeting, so to say? Uh, but um, you know, at the end of the vote, the majority voted against. Uh, and since then, the question comes up from time to time. So uh, your colleagues are doing their job, uh, but. Uh, as the majority of the vote uh, is in the hand of authors and composers, probably there's a certain amount of disenchantment, so to say, towards uh, increasing the number of publishers uh, in, in, in the board. What we could do as a management uh, is that uh, after 2007, after this negative vote, we set up uh, uh, a specific advisory body uh, dedicated to the publishing community, uh, which means that I, as the CEO, uh, shall have uh, quarterly meetings with this specific uh, publishing advisory body. And we have a, a general discussion on the strategic issues, business issues, and whatever the publishers would like to put on the agenda. And uh, of course, any issue could be put on the agenda of the board and the delegates council after. So, I mean, it's a society and without a legal obligation, we, we cannot enforce the members towards a specific result in any vote. I'll try to do my best to, uh, at least to give the feeling to the publishers that they do have a proper representation in the, in the governance of artists. Yeah, because the, of course the the directive talks about fair and reasonable representation. So yeah, which nobody knows how to calculate into numbers. That's interesting. All right, so much to say, but uh, thank you so much, everybody. We've run out of time completely. Um, thanks to the audience for their tolerance in in uh, staying with us. Very much appreciate that. Um, really appreciate everybody. Mitko, I'm so sorry we didn't have time for, to hear from you much, but uh, come back next year and uh, we'll hear more from you. And, sure. uh, Thank you. Thanks everyone who participated. So that brings us to the end of our conference um, today, not the end of the whole event. Um, I think it's been a, a really useful and um, enlightening series of, uh, of panels. And our, I loved our video with our, with our various regional members. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, Johnny will now, I think, talk a little bit about the, the events over the next two days. And um, from me, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate your input. and. Uh, ICMP is nothing without its members. So um, thank you.
thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate everything that uh, we work on together. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the organization. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all our panel, and uh, I can only endorse what uh, Jackie's just said. ICMP is absolutely nothing without its members, its MPAs, and its companies. So, uh, just wanted to to thank all of the participants today for for a great event. I do want to pay particular thanks also to the ICMP team here. They're working day and night, frankly, not just on regulatory and policy and licensing issues. On behalf of the music publishing industry, they are quite extraordinary. Um, they're up at the, at the break of dawn and really they're going home at dusk through difficult practical circumstances and I couldn't be prouder of all of them. So warm thanks to all of the team, including particularly Jenny, Tarek and Raphael. You'll be hearing a lot more from uh, them uh, in the days to come. Uh, if we can't meet in person as an industry, we'll certainly be resuming the ICMP digital series, which I know many of you have been following closely over the last year. So more from that soon. Uh, today we covered a lot of ground, of course, on Hungary, Russia and collective management issues. Um, but one of those, the, this event today is really one of those events which is just crucial for our MPAs. It's by our MPAs, it's for our MPAs, and that's what we'll continue to do. Uh, I, I thought it was very striking that a lot of the issues raised were covering legislation, society relations, anti-piracy and metadata issues. That's really the, the four focal points, I would say, of ICMP's work and uh, really on the last of the metadata issues that leads us beautifully into tomorrow, which is the Society Publisher Forum. Uh, I would ask Jenny to share the link to that. I'm sure all of you have received that a few times. Uh, it's an Eventbrite link to the plenary of the Society Publisher Forum, which is a co-industry initiative uh, run by CSAC and ICMP, supported by other industry associations. And Alex Batterby, who I can see there in our attendee list, Alex, of course, is the co-chair of SPF and has been working through some superb industry initiatives over the last year. So more details on that tomorrow, 2 p.m. Central, uh, 1 p.m. London, 8 a.m. New York. So if you're up early on these side of the States, do join us. It's a global event. There's a lot of implications there in terms of cue sheets and the CWR and CAF updates that we've spoken about today. It's a two day event, so it will carry on uh, over those two days, beginning at 2 p.m. Central both times. You'll see all details and agenda details within the Eventbrite link. So we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, all to say simply, thanks to all of our guests, thanks to CZAC, thanks to our society colleagues, thanks to the FBI, the government, but particular thanks, of course, to Jackie Alway. Uh, thanks for chairing so superbly today, Jackie, and uh, a feather in your cap, and uh, thank you so much for that. And particular thanks, in final words, to our Hungarian hosts, uh, to Gustav, to Tunde, to Antal. Uh, we're really sorry we couldn't be there in person, in the room together. Zoom will have to suffice, but we're really looking forward to seeing you very soon in person. Uh, in the interim, we'll get back to our day job and uh, we look forward to speaking to ICMP members tomorrow before SPF and over the next two days. Thanks to everyone and all best for now. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.